Welcome to They Live with Thoughts, and that doesn't look right. There, that looks better. And this is going to be a local recording, and I'm still experimenting with the lights. So, this contains spoilers, and this is not technically speaking a review, it's a series of thoughts that I had while watching, as well as before watching. And let's see. I got this as a gift, so anything negative that's the end of this video is not out of bitterness. Let's see, I first watched this movie, I think, uh, was it 2009, maybe, maybe, maybe earlier. And I've watched it, I don't know, three or four times since, and then today, not long before hitting record, and starting the frickin' timer, because everything about this particular transmission is going horribly wrong but I wasn't off by a lot yeah I was off by like a minute okay I don't know I guess the aliens really don't want me to spread my opinion on this movie there we go so yeah and I don't think this is the case with this, but my version of this movie may be partially censored. So if I say something about gore, violence, sex, and or nudity in this video that doesn't make sense to you, it's because we watched two different versions of the movie. I chose to watch, watch the one which was more easily available to me and, and or less expensive. I'm probably not going to say anything negative about violence and gore in this video, but just in case I do, I don't have a problem with it. In general, The Thing is one of my favorite horror movies, movies in general, and I also love Cronenberg's The Fly. And I don't have a problem with film sexuality, nudity, disturbing, and upsetting material in general. Monster is one of my favorite movies. Now, my own quote-unquote film critic rating for this is an 8 out of 10. And my personal rating is a 9 out of 10. I love this movie. I just, I, I cannot get enough of John Carpenter. And I rewatched The Thing yesterday. As research, I look for excuses to rewatch that movie anytime. Let's see. And there we go. So forgot about that too. There. Okay, so let's see the First section, notes taken while watching. Honestly, from right away, I can sort of see why people find the score to, I, I don't know what, they use like the word drone. I, I I understand what they mean, but I'm not I'm not gonna I don't know a lot about music and I really don't care to, but I understand what they mean, I just disagree. I, I love the score of this. Some great details when Piper goes to find a job. There's a guy in a wheelchair rolling out of the place, and he doesn't exactly look like, oh, he's leaving because he's super thrilled, he just got a job. They probably don't have anything for him because of his disability. And George smiles at the woman working there, and she seems to have very little patience for him. And, you know, he, he quietly expresses, you know, a lot of places went under, and she seems legitimately irritated. You know, he didn't, he didn't say you know, he didn't, he didn't say that it was her fault, he just said it's difficult to find work, you know, and, you know, you kind of get the sense from her that she's not, she doesn't really have a lot of empathy for his situation when it's completely clear he is not, like, he's not difficult or something, it's not that there is some there's there's basically no reason why he shouldn't be able to get a job. Great details on the woman on TV talking about being famous and never growing old and, and these things. 
I really, really like, let's see, Rowdy Roddy Piper in the role. He's very sort of every man. He doesn't feel like a star. And I know nothing about wrestling. And I'm pretty sure I haven't seen him in any other movie than this one. I am aware that he was a really big wrestling star at the time. So you would think that he would bring that to, you know, like, I'm not saying that it's a bad thing about the movie Predator, but when you watch that movie, like, I, I think I had pretty much guessed that, what's his face, the, the ain't got time to bleed, ain't got time to, die, whatever, that guy. I think when I first read that, oh, by the way, he's, was it, was that wrestling? He was, he was some kind of, you know, it was, it was some kind of sports or combat thing. When I first read that, I was like, yeah, that's really obvious. Like, I was not surprised at all. And, you know, another case would be someone like Mr. T, you know, but in this movie, like, I, I guess maybe from the fight scene with him, you know, him and Frank. Other than that, I really don't feel like this movie ever... Is the microphone working? I think it is, but it seems... Is it low? Yeah. Nothing I can do about it now. I've tried to fix it the best I can. Yeah, the... the um, let's see. Other than that fight, okay, I don't know, I guess maybe the one-liners, but he doesn't really come off as this kind of, I'm, again, I'm not saying this is a bad thing, I'm not saying it's a bad thing about wrestling, but the, you know, they are kind of big personalities, you know, they, they, they're kind of, yeah, braggadocious and... And yeah, in this movie, he really doesn't come across, and, and he really wouldn't have worked for this movie if he did come off as this... No, like, he really seems like just a regular person who's having... Yeah, he's he's poor, and he's trying to make things work. And yeah, like, it really wouldn't have, have worked if... Yeah, like, comparatively, let's say that the Ain't Got Time to Bleed Duck guy from Predator played the role in this movie and played it like he does in that movie you know it would not have worked at all then then i would really have been with the people who say that this movie just does not work i yeah so let's see and it's there from right away like immediately when you see him you get the sense that this is just a regular guy trying to make things work I don't like nobody following me unless I know why. Well, I don't like following someone until I know where he's going. Let's see. I agree with John Carpenter that Frank holds his own. He's not just the sidekick. Honestly, he feels like he could be the lead. You know, obviously he's not. Piper has more screen time and is the more, you know, yeah, more the driving force of the plot. Although, I don't know if it's telling that the moment Frank gets involved, they resolve it pretty quickly. Like, you know, Piper doesn't know what he's doing. He's running around in public with guns. He's attracting cops. Then he walks into a bank, starts shooting aliens, full well realizing that everyone who doesn't have the glasses sees human beings, not aliens there, you know. And the moment, you know, Frank gets involved and he's like, no, I do, I do not want to hear, I don't have a plan right now. No, we're going to make a plan. We're going to fix this. And, you know, he thinks for a little bit and he's like, we got to get in touch with the people who make the glasses. You know, just immediately, he just, I'm not saying that Piper's character isn't, you know, that he's not like, it's not that he's, you know, clearly he is smart because he does deduce this whole thing. You know, once they, 
yeah, some, several important things he does realize, but I don't know, I guess just, you know, like, if Frank was the protagonist, maybe the movie would be, like, a, a third shorter than it is or something. He, he really is, like, the moment that he just, yeah, anyway. Yeah, like, hypothetically, if the movie was rewritten so that Frank was the protagonist, you wouldn't have to change the performance and characterization much, you know, where, like, yeah, there are a lot of other movies where the, yeah, he, he would be the sidekick, and the sidekick really isn't driving the plot anywhere near enough, you know, it's, he's non-threatening, basically, and here, I mean, I think it's telling that when the, the one time that Piper has trouble winning a fight is against Frank. Like, the, the aliens, even though they are, you know, there are, way many, there are way more of them, and at first he doesn't even have a gun. All he can do is see, you know, I've got what them kids see, but that's all he can. And he's, you know, and I'm not, I'm not saying that the aliens are, like, weak. I'm just saying, you know, these are two really, like, they're, they're both really great at winning, but Frank is... I mean, basically, his practically his match, his his equal. And I like that for the first chunk of the movie, while we get glimpses such as the street preacher, the paranoia in science fiction really is not at the forefront. You know, if you stop watching it fairly early on, you would think that this was a short film about how difficult it is to make it if you start out poor in America. You wouldn't have no idea that the explanation is an alien invasion, you know. I mean, comparatively, I'm gonna try not to get off on tangents about the thing too much, because I am gonna make, I've made videos on that, and I'm making more. It's just that that I have on DVD, this I have on VHS. Almost out. The, the next movie is the last John Carpenter movie, and I think I have one more movie that's on VHS, and then I'm back to a more you know, just, just so you don't think that this recent stream of John Carpenter movies means that I'm not reviewing the other John Carpenter movies, because it's just the ones that I have on VHS. I have a bunch of them on DVD instead. So, anyway, in The Thing, it starts right away, you know, immediately. You know, not, not only the fact that we see the the... UFO right away, but like the moment that we start seeing people, the moment that we start seeing anything actually happen, that we have an easier time like relating to than a than a crashing UFO. We actually get the the ah, what's the word? Like immediately, clearly, there's something very wrong. Where in this, I mean, yeah, there's something wrong, but it's what's you know, what was actually wrong at the time in real life. It's not a science fiction kind of there's something wrong from right away. And even at, like, even when we do get them, they're, yeah, like, it's it's really not so overt. And I, I really appreciate that. I really like that Frank, as he says, is out of patience with life. The movie makes it completely clear he's not lazy, which is what conservatives want you to think about poor people who are having trouble making it. And it doesn't shy away from the fact that you shouldn't feel bad. You shouldn't blame yourself that you're having the trouble. But, you know, Frank is not, like, he's not taking it lying down, and he's not just, like... He, like, he realizes that things should be better. They're working so hard, they should be, they should have more job security. And, yeah, a million other things. I'm not gonna, yeah, you know, it's, it's not, it's not exactly so, the, the message of the movie. So I'm not gonna hammer it into the ground this again. I love that the moment the pirate signal comes up, the, 
you know, the, the people at the camp watching the TV, just, they immediately dislike it, as if what they were watching before was so freaking stimulating, rather than incredibly superficial. It really gets the point across that, yeah, we, we you know, we are complacent. We have let this get to, yeah. So creepy seeing the street creature mouthing the words from the guy on TV. I mean, we never do get an explanation for what's going on there because it's not, it's not that he's the one like doing it because we see the transmitter inside the church. It's not that the street creature is the one sending the signal, but yeah, like somehow he's, I mean, clearly he can't hear it from all that way, all that distance away. And he also seems slightly confused at the start and end of it, almost as if his brain is being taken over temporarily. And then he snaps out of it and it's like, well, that, that was weird. Like, you know, like a trance kind of thing. That's, yeah. Honestly, you know, obviously it's not going to happen today, but if this movie had, like, just come out today and it was the exact same movie, I would really be hoping for, like, a spin-off movie that focuses on the street preacher because he is really compelling. And, and yeah, the, the guys at the camp, the audience, TV audience, is more comfortable watching, like, buildings be, like, torn down, just destroyed on TV than the pirate signal that tries to force them to think. You know, the it's it's not as though they're happy that buildings are being destroyed. They're basically homeless themselves, you know, so it's yeah. And and that bit with like the the girlfriend of that one guy is like legitimately scared by the pirate signal. I guess I shouldn't get too much into th thinking more about it and watching it again. The movie doesn't necessarily have the highest opinion of women. Like, the... Almost all of the, the stuff we see on TV that's supposed to be really superficial and, and such is women. And several of the... You know, not, obviously not all of the aliens, but several of the ones that are shown in very superficial, like, you know, the first alien we see is a guy, and he's buying a newspaper. Then when we start seeing women, they're, like, looking in a mirror and fixing their hair, makeup, something. And, like, you know, shopping. And let's see, there's one more that I want to mention. Ah, uh, what's it called? Hair, hair salon, you know, thing. Just, yeah. I think the movie strikes a really great balance between pointing out the complacent, that complacency has allowed things to get this bad without saying that poor people are to blame for their own poverty. Because that really is... It, these, are, these are two incredibly important aspects of the problems of the Reagan. And, and sadly, you know, there are still big problems today. It's, it's important to remember that this kind of thing can't happen in democracy without some level of complacency. You know, it, obviously it can in a dictatorship, because in a dictatorship, there's no way to influence. You know, the, the, I'm actually in, in a, in, I don't remember how long, but in maybe a month or two or something, I'm reviewing, let's see if I can get it right. Sophie Shaw, the, uh, what's it, The Last Days or something like that. Um, my cover just says Sophie Shaw, so I always forget that it has that subtitle, but that is the actual title, The Last Days of, or some, something like that. Which is literally about trying to, you know, affect change in a dictatorship and how horribly badly that goes. And that's not a spoiler. It happens literally at the very start of the movie. But I, 
yeah, you know, in a democracy, you can actually, yeah, you, you can spread the message of, of, of change. But the, let's see, and it's also a movie that really, you know, gets across the point that, you know, like, poor people are in a really bad condition, you know. When, when you hear conservatives talk about poor people, either they're lazy or they really don't have it all that bad. I remember hearing one saying, I mean, poor people, they have refrigerators. And I, I don't, I guess the implication is that if they face a, like, bankruptcy-inducing medical emergency they're supposed to throw the refrigerator at it? I, I don't know, but yeah, this movie get it just, yeah, you know, and, and also, you know, ultimately in this movie, clearly it's no longer enough just to shake people out of, out of complacency because the, the aliens are very, like, effective and, and they're good at using these groups of military and like police to take out the the ah, what's the word their opposition. So, but you know, it started with complacency. If not for complacency, they wouldn't have they wouldn't have been able to take as much power as they do have. I don't know exactly how I feel about the movie. Like, ultimately, it says that, you know, it's it's all of Earth. It's not only America that is, like, you know, under control of the, the aliens. There are, of course, a number of other countries that have huge problems. But, I, I don't know, I guess, I mean, they couldn't really, at the time... It would have been difficult for them to get across that there are countries that don't at all have, and maybe, I mean, yeah, because because ultimately John Carpenter was like, he's he's gone on the record as saying, this is very much about Reaganism, and yeah, there are other countries that have had, you know, problems like, and and some still do have problems like, it, but. Like, this came out in 1988. Even back then, like, some of the Scandinavian countries, for example, were in a much better state. But, I mean, if they started talking about, you know, yeah. The signal must be shut off at the source. I had forgotten that it told us the solution that early on, you know, it, at this point in the movie, the audience isn't ready to fully understand what that means anyway, so it doesn't feel like you're just waiting for the rest of the movie to catch up, but, yeah, like, it's it's smart, I think, to, it's, it's very early on, it's maybe 15 minutes in or something, that we hear that message, and, yeah, I mean, it, it helps, once they do start fighting, you know, for a, for a while, you're catching up. We get a lot of exposition, or, yeah, yeah. I mean, it is essentially exposition. We get a, the, the TV, the pirate signal. We get a lot of stuff there that we're only going to be able to process a little later. Although, you know, people who watched the trailer and knew the concept going in, maybe. But the first time you watch it, if you don't know that they're aliens, like, the stuff that's being said, it's like, that it makes no sense to you, you know, if you don't know what concept they're going to, and, and then you see all these, you know, like, the first time you start seeing all the, the subliminal messages, it's stunning, like, you, you really are, like, it is, the concept really is so just incredible, you know, literally, and, unless you have the glasses, and the, Excuse me. Yeah, what's the word? The the uh, yeah the the fact that it 
says that really early on that the you know the the signal must be shut off at the source. The the let's see. Thinking about it, I that was wait was that the was was that what they were saying in the church, or was that said during the pirate? I think it was during the pirate broadcasting, but. Either way, the audience is only ready to understand that concept a little later in the movie, and then you, yeah, you know, I, I, I don't think the movie should have held off on that. Like today, they would probably not say something like that until much later in the, yeah. And Piper talks to Peter Jason, points out, you know. Four in the morning is like, yeah. Let's see. And yeah, he goes into the church and the. Let's see. Um, yeah, and they have the they live, we sleep, very like, yeah, compelling. I think they did a really good job on keeping the subliminal messages like largely short, you know, you have the money that this is your God, that's a bit long. But other than that, it tends to be just a few words each. And they they really made sure to go with exactly the right, you know, words that are like especially significant where you can just hear you know, that word or those two or three words, and it will mean a lot, you know. They're not waxing poetic or anything. I I didn't find it in, in the research, and I had actually kind of forgotten about it, but I think it was back when IMDb had message boards. I really hope at some point they bring those back, but I think that was where I saw that someone was talking about, like, you know, Sprite used to, I, I have no idea about today, I don't watch advertisements today, Sprite used to have this thing of, like, you know, they would have these sarcastic ads where it would be, like, you know, what, what do really beautiful people drink, and then it'd be, like, the same thing as everyone else, you know, and it would, and let's see, what was it, like, appearance is nothing, thirst is everything, obey your thirst, something like that. And that was actually subversive, you know, that, that wasn't this sort of, you know, aggressive, you know, subliminal messaging kind of advertisement. But then later, I, I forget why, I think it, maybe it was to fit the, you know, to fit on certain, like, there were certain places where they couldn't fit the obey your thirst. So instead, they shortened it to obey, and suddenly it's a subliminal message from they live, even though they started out pointing out the, the you know, I, I don't know how subliminal of a message. No, yeah, yeah, it is kind of a subliminal message when, like, a company is saying, if you, you know, attractive people do this, you know, that, that puts in the, you know, successful people do this. That puts in the mind the the idea that if you are successful, you should be doing this. And more importantly and more effectively, if you want to be successful, you should, you know, you should use our product. You know, I mean, Sprite, w weren't they the ones that even once had like an ad where it's like, does Sprite help you be a better snowboarder or something like that? And then you see this guy doing a really incredible snowboarding. And then, is it the same guy or does it cut to someone else? I forget. But someone, like, falls terribly while snowboarding. And then it says, not if you don't practice or something like that. And again, just, yeah, beautiful. I used to drink Sprite because I liked that their advertisements were really flipping off other advertisements. I, I, I'm not sure I ever liked the flavor, but that's, yeah.
And yeah, I, I meant to say, I really love the title reveal that, that it's graffiti. Let's see. And we see that, you know, the supposed choir singing in the church is a recording and they're discussing inside how are they going to reach enough people? How is it going to be successful? And it's, it's very clever because if, for, for one thing, if there was no recording, some people, if, if, if you went close enough to the church, you might be able to hear their voices. Might not be able to make out what they're saying, but you realize there was someone in there, and that's kind of what they don't want. And if the church is just, like, closed, someone might, you know, walk in and, and see, you know. But if you hear choir singing from in there, who's going to be that jackass who's going to, like, open the door while everyone's in there singing? You know, you're going to feel like a complete jackass and just... Like, you know, you, you don't want to interrupt that, you know, so, yeah. I really love, I, I forget if I read, I, I have to admit, most of the, most of the stuff I read about this movie, I read a couple of weeks ago by now. I, I try to not, I try to be ready for these in, you know, with, with time to spare. So for some of them, I end up reading all of it, like, a long time in hand. I, I forget if I saw someone say, but... I could understand people who maybe feel like there's too much, you know, and, and too silly humor, kind of like, like, Piper maybe falls at least one time too many, and like the bit where he's, he's like confident that he, you know, he's not going to get caught, and then he turns around and, and the, like, the, the preacher grabs him and such, you know, and later he's like in the... You know, it's, it's one thing that he jumps into a garbage truck, but he also, like, ends up falling out of the garbage truck, and he even does, like, a face and has, like, a verbal race, like, oh, come on, like, some kind of, like, I could maybe see, I don't, I don't know that I agree, but I could understand people who think that it goes too silly. Now, and I, I like the detail that, you know, at, at first it looks like the preacher is, like, trying to, choke him or something but no no he's he's trying to see him he's trying to touch his face and then touches his hands and says you're a working man and then there's like the sense that he you know he like basically the preacher was worried that it was a cop or something you know so someone who was working with the aliens but a working man wouldn't be and the people living in the camp talk about what's going on. And there was that thing of, I think Buck Flowers says, you know, every, was it every hundred years, every turn of a century? I forget. It, turn of, sorry. That's the same thing. Uh, no, technically not entirely. But turn of, or was it turn of millennium? Because it was, getting, you know, any, anyway. And Frank doesn't like the you know, Nada is looking into the church, and I, I, I think it's really good characterization. I really appreciate the distinction between you know the the black guy and the white guy. They're in very similar situations, but they have different reactions based on like what they may be. Yeah, I'm yeah. I'm just briefly gonna say like what their expectation is of let's see it's, but but yeah you know while the black guy is tired of how badly the rich are treating the poor he also doesn't want to get involved with something like you know like the church where something clearly something's going on but the white guy who who only very recently who's only very recently become tired of the poor being treated badly you know he he said just like a scene or two ago, you know, ten minutes ago maybe, the, you know, he, he told Frank, you ought to have more patience with life. Let's see. Yeah, he's only recently become tired of the poor being treated badly. He feels entitled to answers and to action. I'm not saying that either of these are wrong perspectives, but it is very telling what their expectation is. They're both American native English speakers 
you know, they, they have, you know, they're, they're both poor. They have a very, very similar situation in a lot of ways. But one of them's white and one of them's black. And culture has told them different things about what to expect. You know, the, the yeah, you know, Frank doesn't want to be one of the, you know, he, he doesn't want anyone to see him as someone who causes trouble which is the, you know, the, the stereotype about black people. And that's how the, you know, that's how rich people have been able to keep them down for so long is by saying they're always causing trouble so that when they start saying, you know, we really should be treated better, you know, a lot of people instinctively, you know, they immediately say, oh, I see, yeah, they're causing trouble. Let's see. Whereas, you know, yeah, the, the white guy, even the poorest white guy in America has been told by culture that he, he is entitled to, you know, if, yeah, thing, things should go his way. If he's aggressive, things should go his way and he should, he should end up like, yeah, you know, so, so the, I'm not saying that every white guy in America believes that, internalizes that, but they have been told to believe that. And then, you know, it's, yeah, a lot of people don't question what they're told. Now. And Piper keeps looking at the church and then suddenly, like, you know, he's, he's looking straight and then he looks up a little bit and there's a helicopter and we have one of those movie logic moments where he doesn't hear the helicopter until he sees it when really that's not that's not how that works you know it's not as though the the binocular maybe they're maybe they're sound blocking binoculars they they don't you can only hear what you're looking at very tense scene as the police clear the camp and genuinely upsetting to see the police use violence against i'm just going to call him tv face the the guy on the pirate broadcast and the blind preacher. Let's see. And Piper helps the guy who's crouching instead of, for example, giving him up. You know, he, he, you know, when he sees that guy, maybe he would think, like, if I yell out to the cops that there's someone hiding here, maybe they'll treat me better or something. But instead, he has empathy for him. Because really, Piper in this situation doesn't really have anything to to lose in in the like he's already you know like like basically he could he could call out for the police to grab this guy he could ignore the guy crouched there or he can help the guy and he chooses to help him with really no like the only reason he does is because he has empathy he feels that this is wrong. He shouldn't be, he doesn't deserve that. He's not a criminal. You know, he shouldn't be afraid of the police. And the, the, and I think they do a really great job of, like, from right away, you get that Nada has a lot of empathy. He's not a, what's the word? Like, the, the, you know, Frank points out that basically everyone's out for themselves, but really, you don't get, like, you know, Nada is not someone who would, you know, step on someone else to get ahead. And that is, of course, also, you know, thankfully, there are people who refuse to, but, you know, it doesn't take very many who, who are willing to step on others before the, yeah, let's see. What was the other thing? What was the other thing? Let's see. D yeah, you know, if we didn't get across that, if, if the movie didn't very early get across that he has a lot of empathy, then once he starts shooting, like, we know that they're aliens, but at the end of the day, you know, and, and to be fair, he doesn't start attacking them until the cops come after, 
you know, and, and yeah, once once the cops come after him, by then you completely realize, yeah, this is why the cops raided the camp and beat the preacher. It's not that there was something, you know, yeah, they know that they're working for the aliens and that, and you know, it's possible that some of the, the cops raiding the, possibly even all of them, we don't see through the sunglasses. It's possible that they were aliens, but the, let's see, yeah, you know, at the end of the day, once he has guns, he does start going around shooting these aliens. If, if you don't accept that he's someone who has a lot of empathy for those who don't have power, then, you know, and, and really, I mean, I could understand, like, maybe today it doesn't play quite the same, the movie, because at the end of the day, it's not about the Cold War, it's about Reagan, Reaganism. Is that the word, or is it only Reaganomics? Reaganomics is a thing. I think. When I use the word Reaganism, what I mean is things that Reagan helped do and, like, accepted was being done and stuff like that, you know. It, it's just instead of me constantly saying, instead of, con instead of saying the entire sentence, things that Reagan did, I just say Reaganism. But, yeah, you know, it's about Reaganism. It's not about the Cold War. But it is a movie that uses some of the Cold War kind of, like, at the end of the day, the, the idea of someone just going into a place and starting and, and shooting, like, and, and we know, I realize this is the second time in the video I've said this, but the audience and Nada both know the human beings don't realize that those are aliens. Like, excuse me, if the scene was shown, excuse me, if the scene was shown, of, of the bank, excuse me, was shown from the perspective of the people inside the bank, then from their perspective, some random guy just walked in off the street and started shooting people. You know, they have no idea what he's seen. They don't, a lot of them probably don't realize about the raiding of the camp. And, I, yeah, honestly, today, like, if the movie had been made today, they would not have had him go into a, a bank and just start shooting, or at least I would like to think they wouldn't, because today that has kind of a mass shooter vibe, but, yeah, you know, the, the that wasn't something that people were as... Like, they, they didn't think about that as much. And and I think in 1988, it did not happen as much. You know, today it's insane how often there are shootings in America. But, and, and part of it is also that now it's, like, it's possible to communicate with a lot of different people about that via social media. And without that, but, yeah. Let's see. But yeah, you know, if you don't, if if you if we didn't know that that Nada had a lot of empathy, he would just look like a crazy person. You know, it, I I do think it's it's very smart that he doesn't. If you're in the bank, then it looks like he's initiating violence, but we the viewer see that it's the aliens who initiate the violence. You know, at first, he's just, like, insulting them. Like, he's talking about how ugly they are. And, you know, one of them, you know, talks into the watch, and, like, I've got one that can see. And then the... What's the word? Excuse me. Then the cops come for him, and they're basically... They're going to shoot him if he doesn't cooperate. But he's a better fighter than they are, and so... 
Or he just gets the the he's he's quicker on the, yeah he's quicker on the draw with his fists than they are with guns. But I do, I do really appreciate that it's not just he doesn't you know just find a gun and start shooting people. No, he he starts shooting when he realizes that they are going to try to shoot him. And he didn't go into a bank to shoot people. He was just ducking out of the... He, he was trying to hide somewhere, and it happened to be the building he went into. And the morning after the clearing of the camp, as we see them trying to salvage what they can, you know, we're also hearing the audio, and we see some of the footage of a fashion show, which is great contrast. We see the reality of being poor and the fantasy of superficial success. Not success in helping people, not success in solving problems, but success in appearance, success in being more seen, having receiving positive attention from others. I that's a really great and and it is like you know there we go. The, the movie gets a lot of stuff right, and it really is true, like, when you, the, the stuff that they had in, like, ads and political speeches and such, it was this kind of, like, yeah, and, and, let's see. Yeah, you know, and, and that kind of thing us does, of course, help, like, if if you have people focused on, it, it actually reminds me a little of Fahrenheit 451, the movie. I have not read the book. I would like to, but I haven't. I do love Ray Bradbury. Just absolutely love his stuff. I, f I forget what it's called, but there was that one with, like, and an infant that's like really smart, just one of the one of my favorite like science fiction stories. Anyway, what was the yeah, so like if you have people focusing on being successful in just having money and being pretty and, and things like that, you know, then they don't focus as much on solving problems and that is you know thankfully it's it's this is a huge problem in mainstream media but today you know you in in a lot of, with a lot of progressive you know yeah you you have a lot of prominent progressives communicating that we need to solve things you know like someone like AOC like she's in power she could she could turn around and say you know what things are good now no she's not gonna you know she's she's trying to solve problems because that's what she was elected to do and that's the kind of thing you know we need more powerful people fighting and more yeah we, we need to communicate it as much as possible that we need to solve problems instead of focusing on yeah Piper is understandably, and, and this is again maybe like, it almost plays like kind of funny that, you know, he's very disappointed that, you know, he finds that the only thing inside the box that he grabbed that they made sure to hide in the church was sunglasses, you know, nothing about the appearance of the sunglasses gives away how important they are, and like, at first, like, he's, he's gonna try, because he just, like, he he put in the effort. He could have gotten caught breaking into the church. You know, he's he's going to at least see what those sunglasses do, you know. But, the I mean, the fact that he puts them in the trash, like, I, I have to admit, I've never been entirely sure if that's supposed to be that he's... Excuse me, I just got to make sure. Yeah. That he stashing it there in case he does need it later i mean it's he does hide it he doesn't just throw it into 
the the top of you know where where like yeah yeah I mean he must he must be stashing it just just in case it is important and he doesn't really you know it's not like he can go home and put it in you no know, he doesn't have a home so he barely you know he didn't even really have one before they raided the camp and now he certainly especially doesn't I, I like that you know for you know he puts them on and he just looks down at at the like the the sidewalk and then he lifts them and uh, I mean it, it looks completely normal now if I don't if I put them on it's black and white if I take them back off it's it's in color like whatever and then he looks up I don't gonna lie I 100% love when he's looking at the world through the glasses. And you have the advertisements, newspapers, billboards, all these things with subliminal messages. I just like, oh, excuse me, this guy is... there. Yeah, I I absolutely love it. It's you know honestly. You know, I, there there are people who say that uh, you know. It it shouldn't be as long as it is, you know. I think the the you know maybe maybe they should like do a, a remake, but as a short film or something. But a anyway, the the like ah, what's the word? I feel like you could make a short movie just by editing the stuff of him looking at and and actually seeing the subliminal messages. You know, it's. Yeah. Honestly, you probably could make like an actual TV ad, like just a one of those little I don't know, 30 second or something, just like you know, maybe maybe it probably should have less violence, but just, you know, regular regular guy puts on some glasses, sees all these subliminal messages, fights back and and you know, to to get that across, I have have any like progressive like politicians and otherwise have they used this movie because it really is like i i'll grant that it maybe hasn't aged incredibly i mean like i said the when i first watched this movie it was maybe 20 years old you know so to me it's i i'm not it's not like some kind of nostalgia thing where you know, oh, back in the eighties, everything sure was great. But just, I I think that you could, what's the word? You could you could probably use, maybe not the movie exactly as it is right now, but the some some of the ideas from it for the yeah. I, I really appreciate that when he first puts the glasses on, the the subliminal messages are to him and to the audience front and center. You know, not not to people who don't wear the glasses, but to him and to the audience. And then later on, they do basically become background again because the whole movie isn't about discovering it. The move the rest of the movie is about fighting it. But the discovery it is like this kind of red pill. I mean that in the Matrix sense, not in the... What's that movement called again? Yeah, I, th I think, you know, is it just called Red Pill? Red Pilling? I... Yeah. With with that guy who got really upset because his mother... I don't remember if it was that she forced him to take diarrhea medication or prevented him from taking it, but he built a freaking movement saying you know oh all women are really awful to men instead of just saying you know some parents make really rotten decisions for their kids i 100 percent agree some people are really rotten parents and i do think we should try to do something about that i, I don't know exactly what i, I guess I, I don't know i i this is not a video about that but but Taking from that that all women are awful is just Jesus Christ, people. Anyway, but yeah, we see the the subliminal messages: obey, marry, and reproduce. No independent thought. 
consume, consume, watch TV, submit. Like words like obey, submit, consume, perfect for describing the kind of culture from the time. You know, it was, yeah, as long as you're like consuming products. You know that that's that's the important thing, it not not solving the the huge problems, and you know obey and submit. These are also really words that like John Carpenter himself, an American, knew exactly what words to use to really push American viewers. You know to really that that those are not like immediately they get like you know flashbacks to leaving to to breaking off from from the you know from from England you know just no we are not going to just obey and submit that's not not this year and another one says buy excellent i, I is it a tracking shot I, it's not a pan and anyway Excellent shot as we see all the magazines through the special lenses. They really did an incredible job on that. It's so much more powerful than if they had to cut every few seconds or something. Like, it doesn't last extremely long. It's maybe, I don't know, seven, ten seconds or something. But in that time, you see maybe a hundred magazines, several, certainly dozens of them. And, I mean, they did have to, you know, it's, it's one thing that, you know, once you see the movie, it's like, oh, you put the glasses on and you see. When they made the movie, it's not just about putting on a special lens. They had to make every single one of those magazines, you know. Like, they, honestly, I can imagine a studio might have been like, John, you got to cut. You, can't, you cannot have that many props that are only going to be seen for that little time. It just, you know, if, if we only make a third as many and we cut, then, it, you know, but it would not have the same effect. It really, like, it gets across that it is basically smothered, drowning in these subliminal messages, you know. And if you actually look at, you know, yeah, like, the amount of magazines on display there, you know, obviously in real life, they don't have, you know, you can't put on glasses and see some little messages, but they have th that many, and sadly, a lot of them are very superficial. And we get some more, do not question authority, no imagination. I really appreciate the dramatic weight it's given the first time Piper sees an alien, and how the alien is clearly not visible to the guy he bought it, it by it. I guess I'll go with he buys the paper from like, and and we see the money. This is your god. Just if that had been the first thing, it wasn't. But if it had been the first thing I ever saw of anything John Carpenter had made, that would immediately have been like I was a fan from right away from the first thing I saw of John Carpenter. But if that had been it, that would also have immediately, like, just, I I love that. I cannot say. And I guess I should just briefly say, I'm not saying that there's nothing good about capitalism. I, like Bernie, am a democratic socialist. I don't believe that we should move entirely away from capitalism. But the people who are rich should not have as much power as they do. But... For sure, I, I forget what it's, it's a planned economy or what, whatever, you know, the, the actual, the literal alternative to capitalism. The, the idea of, you know, basically, well, the government is going to figure out what, you know, what, what we're going to produce for people. And then people are just going to get that complete failure. Don't get me wrong. I would never argue for something like that. It's not that we shouldn't have capitalism is that we shouldn't have unrestrained capitalism. We should have regulations that help protect people. But, yeah. If you, if money is your god, 
I'm sorry, I don't think that's a good thing. I'm, that's all I'm going to say. Excuse me. Excuse me, and sleep, sleep is transmitted from the, the uh, what's it called? The, ah, uh, with the, the, hmm. Str crossing, I can't, I legit don't remember the word, but I think, yeah, like when you cross the street, it has the, the, the you know, it either has the, the red light or the green light. I think the woman talking about Lamaze class is supposed to be another example of the superficial stuff, which, as I already mentioned, is unfortunately largely conveyed through female characters and female performers, performers in ads. It's not as though only women are superficial or women are more superficial than men. That's just the stereotype. Lama's class is a good thing for both the babies and the pregnant women. It, and it's not as though having babies in and of itself is a superficial act that can't solve any problems. If you raise the baby right, they can grow up to help solve things. You know, we're, It's not as though if we stop having babies, that's going to solve the problems of capitalism. And the, and the movie isn't saying that either. It's just saying that if all you do is marry and reproduce if you don't try to fight against the you know and i mean part of it is that if you live within a bad system and then marry and reproduce it's harder than if you know yeah w once you have to take care of yeah once, once you have a family to take care of that it's it's a bit harder for you to really effectively fight against such a big powerful system you know that is maybe easier to do as a young single person who doesn't have a lot to lose maybe you know instead of like because once you have a lot to lose then it's much easier for them to scare you out of fighting but let's see i was yeah it's just briefly yeah, you know, superficiality. And I also just briefly want to restate, I really don't think that John is, like, a misogynist or was when he made this or was. And I, I don't get the sense from any of his movies that he has problems with women. I think if you look at the characterization of Laurie Strode, I really don't think you would get that from a misogynist. You know, can you imagine Michael Bay writing a character like Laurie Strode, you know, rather than, I don't have a problem with Megan Fox herself, but the character she portrays, and yeah, just, anyway, you know, if, if you think that women are more superficial than men, it's probably because you think of the stuff that women get into that is superficial as inherently superficial, and you don't think that the stuff that men get into that is superficial as inherently superficial. You know, the, the, like, let's, for example, see, some, some people get super into certain sports or you know, that, that kind of thing. Let's be honest, that's not exactly brains, you know, what was it? Rocket surgery, you know, that's, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it, but there's also not anything wrong with, you know, the, the stuff that is more traditionally, you know, feminine kind of superficial stuff. It's all about, you just don't let it run your life, is all. You know, no one is completely not superficial. But, you know, this movie is about that superficiality has taken over. And, again, I really don't think, you know, I, honestly, yeah, if the movie was made today, depending on the director, writer, and such, I think it might show both genders as, all genders, as superficial. Because we all have it in us. It's just a matter of whether you give in to that or not, and, but, um, let's see, 
yeah, you know, it's not as though the, the female aliens are the only ones, like, uh, what's the word, depicted really negatively, for example. All the aliens are depicted as really, really, like, they're the only, according to this movie, the only good alien is a dead alien. You know, there's there's no such thing as a an alien that deep down is all right. And at the end of the day, I mean, if you fight to, like, the, the Renegade Cut made an excellent video, and I, I believe it is just titled, They Live, Renegade Cut. He goes into all the awful things that Reagan did. If you helped fight for some of those things, I'm not saying you're, like, not human, but you're not... You're not being humane, you know? And that's kind of what it's... Yeah, I, I, I really like that he straight up made them aliens. Because it is, it is inhumane, it is inhuman. The, the level of cruelty, just how vicious and just, it's, it's, it's legitimately sickening just how monstrous the, the Reagan administration was. And it really is, absolutely, I, I love that John Carpenter made this movie and I, I guess I'm just briefly going to say I'm very glad that some of the movies we're seeing today, you know, some of the, some of the comic book movies we're seeing, some of the villains are defined by things that Trump and some in his administration are defined by. And since some of that is spoilers, I guess I won't go to, let's see, yeah, yeah, just briefly, I'm not gonna name names, but in the movie Joker, very clearly, the, the, the rich, and not just the rich, but the rich who, who have no empathy for those who are not rich, you know, yeah, that that's what you know. That's what makes someone a really bad person in Joe, the the bad guys in that movie. And then you have you know Birds of Prey, where the villain is a narcissist who publicly humiliates women when his ego is bruised. You know the the yeah. I think it's it's. I'm I'm very glad that we're seeing the you know that they are doing what you know doing doing something to try to convey this is you know this is really evil behavior just you know they they're not directly pointing to like yeah you know they they're not saying this is Trump but the, the, you know, and, and hopefully it'll change some minds. Hopefully when, you know, when it's in a movie where someone puts on, you know, a, a uniform and, and fights them, maybe that'll help convey that these are really ugly attributes to have, you know. Sorry, that came off as kind of condescending about comic books. I love comic books. I... Yeah, I love comic books and I love comic book movies. And I am just so happy that we're seeing so many of them and that so many of them are so good. And in some ways, they're just getting better and better. Like, it's it's incredible. Like, if you had told me when I was a child that someday we're going to get really incredible, you know, some of the best movies being made will be comic book movies, you know, I would have looked at, like, Batman and Robin and Batman Forever and been like, yeah, right, you know, okay, maybe some parts of them aren't terrible, but they're never going to be good movies, and now we have just, yeah. And... 
I like the line, you look as ugly to us as we do to you. Just, you know, self-awareness win. And I also appreciate the dramatic weight given to the first time Piper gets a gun and shoots aliens. It is something we see a lot over the course of the movie, and obviously it's not going to be equally dramatic each time. That would be ridiculous. But the first time really should have a kick to it if it's going to affect the audience, and it has, and it does. I mean, over the course of the movie, he fires, I don't know, five different types of guns or something. You know, if every single time was like a huge moment the way it is the first time, that would be ridiculous. That would just be like, don't get me wrong, I love gun porn. I love, like, John Woo can use slow-mo and, and, like, pan across and, like, he shoots... He, he films guns the way others film, like, the female body, you know, the, there we go, and I absolutely love that, but in this movie, it really wouldn't work. If John Woo remade this, I, I don't know if he's necessarily the best for it. Does he even make movies still? I, thinking about it, I'm not sure I've seen a movie from him since, like, Paycheck, which in, has has some strengths, has some weaknesses, but I'm I have it on DVD. I'm going to do a video on it down the line. I'm not sure I've seen anything from him since then, and that was some years ago by now. And anyway, let's see. But I I really I think I mean it wouldn't be exactly the same to excuse me if you made uh, if you remade this movie or i don't know if maybe it shouldn't be a remake maybe more a spiritual successor or something like that but you definitely could make like yeah i th i think that would be a worthwhile i'll maybe i'll i'll over the course of filming this video i'll try to think of who would be really great to direct that and save before the end of the video? Anyway. And yeah, I already mentioned, but bears repeating. I like that, you know, he's, excuse me, he doesn't even intend to go into a bank. He's just getting into a building. Like, I, f I forget, isn't he like ducking away from a, a cop car or something like that? And it just happens to be, but I do really appreciate that, yeah, you know, yeah, the, the rich people in there, I forget, are they all working? Are all the aliens we see in there working for the bank, or are some of them in line? I, I forget, but, yeah. Let's see. I should briefly say, I'm not saying that bankers are by definition evil. I'm just saying, and I think the scene demonstrates that clearly some of the people there, you know, not all of them are aliens. Some of them are just human beings in there. Let's see. And one of the aliens uses a watch to disappear right in front of Piper. I really appreciate the detail that Piper immediately avoids shooting the, the human cop. Like, the moment that he is face to face with someone who has a gun but is not alien, he really makes sure not to. Yeah. And let's see. I appreciate that he at least tries to not treat Holly any worse than at all necessary. And I really like that John lets her stand up for herself. Although, of course, at the end we realize that she's with the aliens. But really like the the at the end of the day obviously it's not right for him it wouldn't be right if she turned out to not be working for the aliens but you can understand where he's coming from and it is this sort of thing of like i feel like if he just maybe stopped shooting people he wouldn't have such a big pro like okay he shoots the the two cops he basically, he has to do something. 
You can make an argument that he doesn't have to shoot them. Certainly not both of them. But he doesn't have to keep shooting after that. You know, he, he goes into a bank and then realizes there are aliens in there. He doesn't have to shoot them. They're not an immediate threat. And see, this is, yeah, this is, this is a Cold War era movie. Because you really don't, that's, that's just not the, the kind of thing that, yeah, really, like, when, when you stop to think about it, you know, he literally walks right into a building and starts shooting people that he, do, like, they're invaders and they're not human. And because it's made during the, the Cold War, that tells the audience, well, they deserve to die. And if we don't kill them, they're going to kill us. Because that's what Cold War propaganda said. The commies are out to get us. They're going to infiltrate. They look human, but they're not. They're not human. And if we don't kill them, they're going to kill us. So that, yeah. I do think, I, I think it would be well worth making a another very much like this movie. If it exists, please put it in the comments. I honestly, I don't know of any movie that is quite like, excuse me, you know, some of the same themes, sure, but anyway, yeah, I, the, the, um, if, yeah, if you made it today, you could get away from the Cold War trappings, and maybe make it a little bit more egalitarian feminist in, in the, it really did not have to focus so much on you know, all the superficial women stuff. See, if one of the ads was, like, for wrestling, then the audience wouldn't be like, oh, man, look at how superficial th this stuff is. They'd be like, oh, yeah, that's badass, you know. So, yeah. Let's take a look. It's in a book. Wear the glasses. I completely disagree with those who complain about Meg Foster. I think she's absolutely perfect in the movie. Just when, like, when you first see her, you accept that she's a normal person. And at, at the time, he does, like, we have no idea that any humans ever work with the aliens. As far as we know, the problem is alien entirely. But then as we... Yeah, you know, later in the like when you see her attack him and he goes out the window and this whole thing, the first time you watch it, you don't think, ah, she must be working with the aliens. And we even see her call and say, no, 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 I'm okay. And she gives like, what was it, the the address or something and her name and such. We think that she's just talking to the regular cops because she's, you know, she was just kidnapped basically and. Not basically. She was. She was kidnapped. You know, how, however much he's reluctant, he is a kidnapper in, in this, you know. So, and, and then at the end, when she comes back, and they even almost have a tender moment, like, you're like, oh, she saw the error of her ways. You know, she understands now. And then you see her shoot Frank and almost shoot Nada. I feel like every step of the way, she is convincing. Like, when you first see her, you can accept that she, you know, she's got guts. She stands up for herself. She points out that what he's doing is wrong. You know, what, what's the line? You're not sorry. You have a gun. And, and the, you know, yeah. And, and, but, but you accept that she's just a civilian in all this. She's not part of the, she's not. She's not on either side. She doesn't know that there are sides. And when she comes back, you accept that she now realizes there are sides and she's on his side. And then when you realize, there at the very end, you realize, no, she, she knew who they were. She's been working with them the whole time. Everything she's done in the movie was to service them. You know, I, I feel like they, it, it really works. And there are not many actors who can pull that off. If you think about it, she doesn't have a lot of screen time. But 
she and and ultimately like a lot of the time she is somewhat like it's not the most uh, i don't know what the varied performance maybe you know she doesn't necessarily play it hugely different whether she is like uh, yeah we based on the situation she's in Although they're at the end, it's, you know, you can tell that she's, she's now evil, you know, but she really sells it, and, yeah. And Piper realizes that he needs to deal with the Cable 54 TV station, and then Holly hits him and crashes through the window and loses both the sunglasses and the guns. I really appreciate that sort of, like... It seemed like, like when he finds out about the, the TV station, you're like, oh, this is gonna, you know, in, in just a few minutes, he's gonna be, you know, you, you expect it to, like, soar and, and go, okay, we're getting there. But then, you know, he, he gets, oh, TV station, and then she hits him and zoom, just nosedives and ends up, like, almost as, like... He, yeah, it's not even that it's as bad as when he first just, like, was, well, he had the, the glasses and such. No, now he doesn't have the glasses, and everyone thinks he's a, he's a, you know, like, murderer. He, you know, everyone knows his face and knows that he goes around gunning what to look, what, what to looks them, like, people. You know, so, yeah. And we see him sleeping up against the wall, sitting down. It's the second time we see that, but this time he looks so much more like he's missing something he badly needs than before. And this, that also reminded me, I like the detail that earlier he mentioned that he had his own tools, so the place he was about to work at wouldn't even have to lend him any in case that all the tools were in the hands of workers, you know. I, I really, Frank is just such a nice guy, not, you know, uh, outside of the, of the fight, obviously, but the, seriously, like, he doesn't, like, he, you know, he, he recognizes Piper, and he's like, be careful, don't let anybody see you, and he doesn't, like, you know, he's, he's not like, guys, you have to hurry up, call the cops, get, you know, someone get over here and help me grab this guy. Uh, the the killer is right here. No, he's like, I you know the the what's the word? He has some sympathy for him, even though he now thinks that he's a killer. You know, I mean, I mean, I guess basically in Frank's eyes, it's like I I mean, I guess I I guess I can believe that he snapped because he did. You know, he. He was way too curious about that church, and I don't know what happened, but he snapped, but he, at least he used to be a good guy. I'm not gonna, you know, just, yeah. And Piper goes to the trash can, and the sunglasses are no longer there, but he does get into the garbage truck to find them, and I, I guess I can kind of see what people mean if they think that the movie gets a little too goofy and silly Well, when he's rolling out of the garbage truck, and... You know, earlier he fell, like, twice in a row. You know, he doesn't just fall out the window. He then also falls another time, you know, very soon after. Yeah. And Frank, you know, is giving Piper one week's pay. And just, yeah, he's he's really very understanding, considering, you know. he. I mean, he, all he says is, stay away from me. I have a wife, I, you know, I, I, I'm not gonna just, yeah, it's, it's very understandable, but it's, and, and, you know, Piper checks to make sure, okay, he's, he's human, he tries to convince him about the glasses, and we have the fight, and I'll, I'll be talking more about the fight in detail later in this video, I guess I'll just briefly say, I really don't have a problem, if I had any problem with it, it would be that they should maybe have been a little more... It doesn't bother me when watching it, but I do... You know, I, I wish that 
I understand why it bothers other people, and I do wish somewhat that they didn't. It's a it's self indulgent, and hypothetically, let's say that you know. What's that Twilight Zone episode where, you know, everybody else is, is dead and now I can read books, you know. If I was in that situation, but it was with watching movies, then I would be like, I love this fight and I don't care. But given that there are other people who I would love for them to watch the movie, I, I did. I showed this to, like, one of my friends and maybe it didn't exactly help that she was a girl, but I think she liked the movie overall, but during that fight, like, several minutes into it, she turned to me and said, is this for real? Or something like that. You know, she was like, just, this this will end soon, right? And, and yeah, but <sighs> she did end up liking the movie. I'm, I'm almost certain. She, she largely and and she she was into like you know sci-fi and and such i didn't i didn't just you know i didn't show it to a girl who normally doesn't watch stuff like that at all no and 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 she hugely agreed with the message and that was one of the biggest reasons that i you know but the it's it's too bad that it you know maybe maybe they should make like maybe I guess it's possible that there, no maybe there should be like a DVD version where when you you know press the button to start the movie it then takes you to this brief little sub menu where you know in addition to like go back to main menu there's two options play with the full fight play with shortened fight because it would not be difficult to just cut it, just trim it a bit. You know, it did not have to be as long as it is. But no, if it's just me watching the movie, I really love the fight. I, it's just, yeah. And, I mean, I guess I've pretty much made it clear already. I'm not into wrestling. I don't usually like in movies when they start pulling wrestling moves. But... Yeah, in, in this one, I don't know, it just works for me for, for some reason. But, yeah, anyway, the, the I don't have a problem with wrestling. I And I don't have a problem with people who like wrestling. I just, you know, it, it shouldn't be, I, I guess, first and foremost, and I'm sorry this is going to sound condescending and like a stereotype, I think it's very important that anyone who watches wrestling is fully aware that it's not yes it is in part ah what's the word at least some of it is performative you know it is not a i th i just think that some people who get too into it end up wanting that sort of thing. I'm not saying that all the people who, you know, who, who really support Trump are also into wrestling. I'm just saying that some of the, I mean, the smack talk in wrestling and the way Trump talks to appeal to his supporters, they're very, very similar. And I'm sorry, but I really think that's where Trump learned it. I think he thinks that's what it is to be a man. You know, if you're a man, you talk talk crap about other people. You know, and that's it's just it's one of the one of the biggest problems with Trump is the fact that he's not offering any solutions. Some it's occasionally he will point to an actual issue, but then instead of talking about how to fix it, he just brags or like puts down the other, you know, like the whole thing with, you know, we're going to build a wall and Mexico's going to pay for it. 
if you think about it for two seconds, you can tell that it doesn't make any sense, but they just like the sound of it. And that really sucks. And, and just, and I swear, I promise to you, if what Trump was doing to appeal to, uh, to his base, if instead of smack talk, it was that he was like, I don't know, I guess, putting on a, a comic book costume and like, let's see, what's, what's, uh, and he, you know, had a CGI fight against someone who had the same type of powers that he did, I would still be saying this is bad rather than saying, you know, now I'm starting to see what people like about this Trump guy. And again, keep in mind, I love that aspect of comic books. I just don't. Well, that's it's not very realistic that that's going to be part of anybody's political campaign. But I just I do think that it just. Smack talk makes people feel like there's something, like, what's the word? It makes people, yeah, it, it makes people who don't have a lot of power feel either powerful themselves or feel like they at least have a powerful ally. And, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, that's, that's part of my problem. I, I really... I don't want that to come from smack talk. I want that to come from supporting politicians who actually... So can you imagine if instead of smack... It, like, I mean, it, yeah, just briefly. Yeah, instead of just the bad smack talk where Trump will say, you know, this person, the, the, their show is actually doing really bad in the ratings and they're, they're never being very fair and, and such. Instead of that, if it was the kind of, like, the, the way that AOC and Elizabeth Warren, who has been disappointing lately, but still does sometimes, like, I don't know what Bloomberg was thinking. Get just, like, <laughs> she, like, she loves verbally destroying bankers what and i don't know what made him think that that wasn't going to go incredibly badly for him but you know that kind of thing if trump was talking like that the the way that they attack the the their opponents you know where it's fact based and solution oriented Instead, you know, it's not the fact that he insults people, it's the people he does insult and the way he chooses to insult them that, and the fact that the insults are entirely instead of political action that leads to proper solutions. Like, he's, he's basically done nothing except enrich some people and lock up a bunch of immigrants, which, honestly, any idiot could do that with just, like, one hand tied behind, tied behind their back. Come on. Even people who love him, can't you at least admit that he's not very impressive? He hasn't done something that was difficult to do, but that's the thing. He thinks, when he thinks of being a man, it's just about bragging and coming on really strong. It's not about actually solving things. Excuse me. Anyway. And Frank pretends that he's helping Piper. Yeah, sorry. We're back to the fight. Helping Piper up and punches him. So when Piper goes for, you know, hitting him in the groin, I mean, Frank fought dirty before Piper did. So that's, uh, yeah. Still, do not do not go for the, the groin. And Frank almost steps on the glasses. Oh, man, I'm sorry. See, okay. I Like I've been saying, some of the comedy stuff 
is is kind of silly, and I understand if you don't like it. But if you don't find that funny, I'm sorry. I do not understand where you're coming from at all. That's funny. You know, it's he, he hit the car. But the, he was trying to go for, for Frank, but Frank gets out of the way, and the car, he was standing in front of the car. <laughs> and he, like, just, like... He breaks one of the windows with the, yeah. And Piper finally gets Frank to put on the glasses. It's also very fortunate that, like, immediately there are aliens. And can, can he see, I forget if he can see the, the billboards from right there. Because if he just, like, looked, you know... Yeah, it's not, it's not like every single, like, yeah, what if he just looked down like Piper did at first with the, yeah. I want a room. I really love Piper's one lines. And yes, so, sorry, that wasn't one of them, that was Frank. Yeah, it was because Piper, yeah, I noted that when Piper said, life's a bitch and she's back in heat. Or, or was it ain't love grand? It's one of those, right, I don't know. We can't be the only ones who can see. We gotta find the people who made these. I appreciate that they gave that moment of realization to Frank when a lot of movies would have refused to let him be that useful and important since he's not the white guy starring in the movie. I really love the whole bit with them talking where Piper goes into the story about his father, which is clearly part of why he's so willing to go against authority now. You know, he... he yeah. <laughs> With this movie, there's only so much I can say that's going to be new, because the movie really does spell it. Like, no, he doesn't just say that, and then, you know, the audience sits there, oh, when I see one. No, then he goes on to say, but I ain't daddy's little boy no more. Oh, because you used to follow authority, but now you don't, and that's why, oh, I'm glad you told me. Just, I love the movie, but it's not exactly subtle. Which is actually funny, because some elements of it are kind of subtle, but yeah. And Peter Jason finds Frank. I appreciate the decision to have them in magical contact lenses at the end. I really don't think the last portion of the movie would have been as effective if they, if they stayed in sunglasses all the time. I love Peter Jason's monologue about selling out. And Frank gets one of the, you know, supposedly expensive watches that are actually radios. Let's see. And Peter Jason talks about how important it is to organize. I like the detail that, you know, Holly shows up. She straight up says, no, it's not the radio station. You know, I, I forget the letters of it, but there's a radio station. She says, it's not them. I, I'm not sure she's the one who says that it's 54, but the, the you know, yeah, but Nana already knows that, because the, yeah, anyway. She obviously thinks that none of them will make it out of that room, because she knows the soldiers are right outside, you know, they're, they're right behind us, you know, and the, the, let's see. Yeah, you know, she says that to lower their guard. You know, everyone in the room is now more, like, I guess you could make an argument that why did she go in there anyway? Because it's not like, you know, I guess she's there to help the, she, yeah, they didn't have, need to have the character, excuse me, there. I think part of the reason is that they wanted it to seem as though he really is... Ah, what's the word? Sorry, she... She is trustworthy now, you know, so that when they find her in the TV station later, we have that, we, we expect that she's trustworthy. Yeah, I, th I think, you know, I, I saw at least one critic review say, you know, oh, it's got so many plot holes. I guess maybe one of them is supposed to be why did the military attack when the... But they, yeah, they blow open the... But she might have known that. 
she wasn't standing right in front of it, so they would have been like, you know, we're gonna blow open the the wall there to get in, and so so make sure you're not staying too close to it. And then once they get in, they know she's there, so they, you know, I mean, it's not like they dropped a bomb on there. They they go in with guns, so they they're aiming. They're making sure not to aim for her. I really love that the tender moment between Piper and Holly is interrupted by an explosion and an action scene. Just, it, you, you really don't see enough of that. Because it really, I like, it seems like this is going to be their big tender moment. And Frank even gives them a look. And yeah. And Frank tries to get the watch working. And here we get one, another of the, the kind of silly, you know, Frank, what? Frank, what? Frank, what? I don't know. Maybe you should look. It, it, you know, maybe that's gonna tell you what is going. You know, meanwhile, it's not like Piper couldn't say, "Frank, look out" or something. You know, but, but it's funny. That's that's legitimately funny. They both have the timing and delivery necessary. You know what? If the again, if this movie came out today and was exactly like this, I would watch like a buddy comedy where just these two are are dealing with weird things in in different like you know yeah like a like a tv series where every episode there's some kind of weird sci-fi thing going on and uh, you know yeah anyway and I really love the yeah once once they get into the yeah once the watch malfunctions and the whole thing they get to the fancy dinner I really love it with them applauding their own wealth and the defeating of the the freedom fighter group you know the just I mean it's not just the fact that they are obscenely wealthy you know they're they're getting wealthy off the backs of other people who have an extreme you know a lot of people who have a hard time getting by they're relishing like they're they're just so happy about it just yeah i have to admit i didn't realize on the first viewing that the rich guy there at the end is one of the guys we saw watching tv at the start of the movie you know buck flowers The, the transportation to the other planet or whatever it is, very like, like, like 50 sci-fi movie kind of, yeah. Buck Flowers really does a great job with this, like her, his, sorry. It's because I was thinking of the word performance, so her, his performance is like, he is a completely different person. You know, once, you know, back when he had nothing and to now when he's rich. Is this the two minute break or the 30 second break? And Frank throws a green and it's like, I think this break might end up being longer than two minutes. The woman gives Piper the directions he asked for and he's like, thank you very much. I mean, just because you're going through the building with assault rifles and everyone's terrified of you, doesn't mean you can't be polite, and yes, I realize that's the joke the movie's making as well. I really appreciate the that, you know, Frank and Piper are being really tactical at the end, making sure to look behind them every so often, for example. You get the sense that they're not just winning this fight because they have plot armor, but because they're being smart. You know, that's something... I know that Ghosts of Mars is not a good movie, but there are elements of it that I still love. And I really do appreciate this thing of them, like, there's there's fights where they will, like, stand two, like, two people will stand next to each other and both shoot at enemies. And then once they're out of bullets, they will back up and two other people, like, who are standing behind them will take their place and shoot while they reload. I, I just, I want more of that in movies. I'm sorry, I really, really... It just has more of an effect than when you never see them reload. You know, that's another. Th that's another thing I really love about John Woo and 
face off. You know, some of the best stuff in that movie is when people reload. Holly shoots Frank right in the temple and we realize she actually is on the side of the aliens and she was involved in getting the armed forces to the safe house Let's see. and she does try to talk him down she doesn't immediately shoot him and it is like the the several times in the movie they try to appeal to them and say you, you know, it doesn't have to be, you, if you work with them, things will go well, you know, and, yeah, because, because that is it. The, the, the big problem is that a lot of people bought into that line, you know, you know, as, you know, instead of fighting against Reagan, they were like, ooh, I, I like to be rich too, though, and, yeah. And Piper manages to sneak out the gun to shoot Holly. And he destroys the transmission tower, but is shot by the helicopter. I love him flipping off the helicopter as one final act of defiance. I really appreciate the movie doesn't overstay its welcome. It's neither too long or too short. And once the movie has made the vast majority of its point uh, points about Reagan's America, it ends not very long after. You know, with end credits, the movie's 94 minutes. I think without, it's maybe 91, something like that. It really does not go just absolutely crazy with, yeah. You know, some movies that are political, even if you agree with politics, it's like, oh, wow, you, I, okay, we get it. Move on, move on, you know. And for sure, this is a movie that, like, I, th I think the word preachy is accurate when describing this movie, but it also makes a lot of it plot-related and such, which really helps. Notes taken before watching. So, the... I, th I would say the short story is well worth reading or listening to. I, f I found the... I found a... what's it? Ah. A version that's read aloud for for free legally. Let's see. And as such, yeah, I'm I'm briefly gonna I'm gonna spoil some of the the short story. So I'm just briefly gonna get into some elements of the short story. The the yeah in in the short story he is at first better at and more interested in hiding that he's aware of the aliens and subliminal messages. There are no shades in the short story. It's a hypnotist that wakes him up, makes him see unintentionally. The, the hypnotist only meant to bring him out of the smaller hypnotism. It was, it, they, they don't really go into great detail about it, but it's basically one of those things where like a hypnotist will do a stage show and he'll be like, may I have some participants from the audience? And you know, he wakes all of them up from the, it, it specifies. George is the one, the only one who was woken up completely, but everyone was woken up from the immediate hypnotism. And let's see. Oh, right. Yeah, I guess I should. Yeah, tell you what. I'm going to hold up my left index finger until I'm done talking spoilers for the short story because I do want to briefly talk about spoilers. Seriously? If you have never read the short story and the film really appeals to you, please mute until I lower my left index finger because you should read it for yourself. Okay, here we go. So the very start of the short story is that the aliens use subliminal messaging to tell him that he will die of a heart attack eight in the morning. Hence the title, Eight in the Morning, which is, yeah, the, the original isn't called They Live, and I'm really glad that he retitled it. It's it's one of those things where, like, if you read it as a story, like, I don't, I've lost count of how many Philip K. Dick short, like, sorry, written stories, how many stories he wrote that have a great title for something written, where when they made the movie, they completely retitled it, because it's like, we're not calling the movie that, you know, and... Okay, I'm sorry, I'm just really briefly gonna... Blade Runner used to be called 
do androids dream of electric sheep? Which actually has a a real, you know, people. Not everybody who knows that title knows that their the story actually has literal electric sheep. They have electric animals because actual animals are so rare. And I don't blame them for not putting that in the movie, but I do love that title. I'm glad they didn't call the movie that. Total Recall is called We Can Remember It For You Wholesale. There's no way that would be a movie title. Minority Report is actually the same title. Let's see. Actually, I, yeah, I guess that's the... Anyway, to back to... Yeah. At the end of the short story, 8 in the morning, he manages to get into the TV station and stop the signal. And apparently... You, sorry. Not even, evidently even start a war between the aliens and humans, which honestly I also think isn't that the idea at the end of this movie that it starts the war? It doesn't it doesn't mean that the fight is won. There's still a ton of them, and many of them have guns. Like it's they, they have control of the military at the start. No no no, it's honestly I'm not even one hundred percent certain that we're supposed to take from the Wii that humanity wins. But at least it's a fight. You know, at least we try. At least we don't go down just taken out by subliminal messages, you know. The, let's see. Anyway, back to this short story, 8 in the morning. Managed to start a war between the aliens and humans. But, he does in fact have a heart attack exactly 8 in the morning. In other words, even if you are acutely aware of it, and you are fighting it, Subliminal messaging can still affect your behavior. Deeply compelling. I, just, I love that. Okay, and no more spoilers for the short story. So if you muted, yes. No more spoilers for the short story in this video. I'm not going to get too much into, like, other people have already talked about that, yes, very likely... Honestly, almost definitely, the Duke Nukem 3D appears to start where this movie ends. Like, the first thing is that you're on top of a, of a building, and something blows up, and then you go on and fight a bunch of aliens who are, excuse me, you know. I mean, obviously it's not a literal continuation, excuse me, it's not supposed to be a direct sequel, but I would definitely say it is very intentionally bringing the, it's it's referencing that you know and i think it's a great reference i'm not going to talk too much about the game i i did beat it once you know way back N not when it was brand new mind you i don't was it that no no i played it when it was brand new but i didn't have access to all the episodes but some years later, I played all of them, but that was maybe 10 years ago or something. I enjoy playing it fine, but I'm not sure I'm going to... I have. I currently have no plans to... to uh, I actually I do have plans for the first two, but not the third one. And yes, there actually are. There, there are two that are hugely different. But it is, in fact, the third Duke Nukem game, and... I'm not going to get into a discussion of Duke Nukem and sort of the, the yeah, I'm, I'm not going to get into that here. Excuse me. Now, let's see. So, right, yes, the fight scene goes on for a long time. Obscurus Lupus says in A Short Live That They Live that it goes on for about six and a half minutes. MDB Trivia says 5 minutes and 20 seconds, which makes it really frustrating to see user reviews claim it goes on for 20 minutes. If you don't know the movie, and you read that and you believe it, you might not watch it, which you might if you know that it's not that, you know. Anyway, I really hate when people, if you're going to say that, make it clear that it's an exaggeration. Because there are movies where action scenes go on for 20 minutes. You know, some of them I quite enjoy, honestly. The, the I guess I shouldn't give away exactly what... Yeah, I'm just going to say, 
at least one of the MCU Avengers movies have action scenes where from the start of the action scene and until the the whole thing is completely resolved yeah 20 minutes pass without any real like without the yeah the the fight the an action scene that goes on for as long obviously it's not quite the same because the the action scenes you know in this the the fight in this is two men in an alley punching and hitting each other and using wrestling moves and such where in those movies it's you know yeah but given that it is true in some movies that an action scene goes on for 20 minutes some people might end up believing that if if you say yes yeah yeah i've i'm just gonna read out my notes some of this i already said i personally love the fight but i understand why not everyone does however what it illustrates perhaps preacherly metaphorically is how resistant many people are to even consider that the powerful are screwing them over it's not just that he claims what the glasses are showing isn't the truth he straight up repeatedly refuses to even wear them and you know I, I saw at least one reviewer say ah oh, it's really stupid that it goes on you know they're fighting over sunglasses yeah but the point is that he's it's it's one poor person trying to convince another poor person that they're being screwed you know that that the rich are are screwing them that you know frank doesn't even want to consider you know he he knows this guy he sees a profound change in him and he's willing to help him a little but he's not willing to consider again metaphorically that his perspective on what the world is like is not um that there's there's more to it you might say than what he thinks is going yeah let's see yeah you know the the quote is I'm giving you a choice. Either put on these glasses or start eating that trash can. In other words, you'll be stuck living in crushing poverty, eating trash, if you will, if you don't start, in real life, politically and not with guns, fighting the rich and powerful. Let's see. I kind of wish the movie didn't end on a rape joke. But other than that, I do love the ending, like most of Carpenter's, and I like the the dig that uh, you know Siskel and Ebert are aliens. The you know when complaining about the the violence used by John himself and by George was it George Romero? Was, was it George Miller? I think Romero, but yeah, you know. And yeah, I really appreciate, you know, the powerful aliens look like white people without the glasses and some are bankers. And I'm really glad that very clearly none of them are Jewish, which would for sure be anti-Semitic. And but no, there's, you know, when you look at them, every time you see a human that has the and honestly, even the like the the. Uh, the, the design chosen isn't anti-Semitic, which would very be very easy. One very frequent trope is comparing them to rats and vermin. It would have been super easy for the alien design to be like a like a long nose kind of thing, and and, and like like a crooked hook nose. Is that the thing? I, it's been a while since I looked at it, and I spend a significant amount of effort trying to not think about the the hideous depictions but no they 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 don't look like what anti-semites stereotype jews as and i don't intend to talk about the neo-nazis trying to co-opt this film instead i direct you to renegade the renegade cut video on this film i have nothing to add to what he says and just real close real quick Real quick again, that video is simply called They Live Renegade Cut, or Renegade Cut They Live.
one of those. If you put all four of those words in the YouTube search box, you will find the video. I tried. Trust me. Now, let's see. Yeah. And some critics who like John Carpenter's other movies said the music is droning. I already mentioned that I see what they mean, but I disagree. But the I do think it's worth noting that these are people who like his other scores. You know, this is not... I completely understand, especially today, a lot of people might not like his, you know, the, the synth score kind of thing. I think he did incredible with it back when he made movies. And honestly, I, I love what he... The, the redo of the, the Halloween theme that he did for Halloween 2018. And I can't put into words how excited I am about the let's see for now is it or yeah I think it is for sure getting two sequels which you know I, I think I, did I see someone say that ah well then you know how the first one's gonna end technically not because some of these movies do have like I mean is that a spoiler I guess I'm just gonna say there are slasher movies where even if you've watched some of the sequels, you don't know what they're going to do in some of the later ones. Because they really go... You did not see that coming. You know? Anyway. I, th I think he did incredible work on, on scores. And the... You know, it's also... When, you know, when he did it back in the mid to late 70s, throughout the 80s, you know, back then, we were more like, yeah, you know, synth score, sure, no problem. Today, it wouldn't really, I, I don't, I'm not hugely into hearing it outside of, like, Halloween movies, or maybe if, like, I feel like, was there maybe some synth score in Thor Ragnarok? I think that worked well there, but that's also that style, you know, but anyway, I mean, some of this movie is gritty, and when you, like, synth score is not necessarily really gritty, but anyway, the, the, let's see, uh, let me think, yes, right, I want to, I think it's worth noting that even people who like his other scores don't like the music in this, and I mean, I've, I've found myself humming it when, uh, you know, and I, I used to watch this, I had, back when I had friends, I had several friends who also were hugely into John Carpenter, you know, like, every so often, you know, they'd, you know, they, they'd come visit me, and I'd be like, I have a new John Carpenter movie, and they'd be like, put it on right now, and it was awesome. They also really loved his, his music. And this one included, it, it really, it has that, kind of like, I, I, it's incredible to me how varied his scores can be when a lot of the time, yeah, it's this kind of synth stuff, you know, and if, like, if you listen to a lot of the different ones in close succession, you can say, okay, yeah, that's, that's definitely the same composer, but the movies have very different feel an atmosphere to them from the music, you know, this Halloween Prince of Darkness, you know, very different, like maybe some of the same feel, but different degrees kind of, if that makes sense. And some critics who like John Carmer's other movies find that the pace is too slow and there's too much walking around. The, honestly, to me, this is like with the movie, The Road, I think it's perfect that there are sections where not much happens to the characters because life in that situation would have a lot of tediousness. And in with both this movie and that movie, I don't feel that the movie is ever tedious. It conveys that to them it is tedious. Of course, real life, sorry, life in that situation would not be nonstop action. And honestly, I, I think it's a little, it's too bad that so many movies have depicted it as non-stop action because I think that's missing something really of a big part of the 
like the the what's the word it's important to not only emphasize how obviously yeah you know action and and tension and such in both the situation in this movie and in that movie i'm not going to talk too much about i don't think i'm going to give away what that movie is about at all because i don't want to i've i've done videos where i talk about i'm 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 doing more videos where i talk about that movie but yeah i think that came out right well, what was i going to say I think that it's worth noting that there are also tedious aspects. And I think it just, it increases, it gives a broader sense of how, of what it's like. You know, similar to how today we can have very varied action scenes in movies where, you know, if you go back some, some years and decades, it used to be just, well, some people punching each other and, some, and or some people shooting at each other. And that's it, you know, and today we have really, really varied, uh, you know, I, I think the, the movie Birds of Prey does a really great job. I, I saw where someone else pointed out, you know, Harley Quinn is not huge and she's not like super muscly, so she has to use her size and agility to take out some of her enemies because some of her enemies are big muscly you know guys so and yeah anyway as someone who greatly appreciates deep-seated paranoia in fiction i really love that when he finally does trust a human being in holly he ends up getting pushed out a window and then at the end we find out that that wasn't just her freaking out not believing the story She's one of the human beings who support the aliens, so even the humans can't necessarily be trusted. And we realize that she was the one who called the cops on the hideout once we see the very ending when she tries to stop Nada in a way that can be interpreted as though she's scared and confused. And she does a really great job being creepy. Yeah, I'm just... I'm not going to dive deep into this. I'm just briefly going to say... I wish Nada didn't body shame the female aliens. Let's see. Yeah, here I wrote down some of the... Let's see. Yeah, I think a few of these uh, subliminal messages I did not already mention, so I'm just really... Great. Yeah. Conform, that's another really great one. Stay asleep. I think I already said do not question authority, but it's still a good, yeah. I love the preacher and the various warnings that the aliens are there. Honestly, if someday the technology is there so that it can be done seamlessly, if someone wanted to go back over all the John Carpenter movies, and just put preachers warning of, of horrible things into the ones he's made that don't have them. I would, I, I mean, I, it, you know, tr try to make it in, in like fit the, the tone of the rest of, of the movie. And, you know, I, I don't, don't do like a Star Wars special edition kind of thing where we no longer get to see the original version. But, yeah, I, I'd be for it because I, I love it every time he does it. I, I really, yeah, just he's so good at it. He's, he's so good at it, you almost wonder why doesn't he put it in every single And then you stop and think, I mean, he almost, he almost does. Let's see. I, almost every single one of them, almost every single movie he's made where it makes any sense for there to be like a a preacher, you know, with giving really scary warnings, like almost every single time it makes sense, it's there. You know, clearly he was really into that element. 
I really love that in this movie, the hero of the resistance stumbles backwards into the whole thing. He's, he wasn't political at all at the start of the movie. And by the end, he's taken out the transmission tower. You know, like, in, you know, 91 minutes, he goes from just completely... Yeah, I, just, I really think they that's a, that's a great, just... Yeah, it just, it's it's hilarious to me that it's not, you know... There are so many where the hero is this dedicated dude, but no, it's just like he's... He's pretty good at punching and shooting, and, you know, he, I mean, I mean, there at the end, it almost even seems as though, oh, so, I mean, it's going to be an entire group that's going to go up against the, the TV station, and I don't know, maybe they'll even, like, manage to sneak in there, nope, explosion, action scene, and it seems as though the only two people left are, actually, yeah, the, the, the two military guys are like celebrating and the the guy giving the speech at the at the dinner also says that they just won you know so yeah let's see so i watched the trailer on youtube it's a minute and 48 seconds excellent excuse me very creepy and there's this excuse me there's this thing of it only shows that the full title is They Live at the End, but like every so often in it, it will show they, and I think it's the same font, and there's this creepy voice that says, they, and it's just, it's super cool. The trailer has him say the bubblegum bubble line, but they censor the word ass with footage of shoot, like he's a, I've come here to chew bubblegum and kick and he starts to say at, and then we see like guns firing, and then it cuts back, and he finishes the one line. It's like, I mean, I guess there are places where you, where they would not want the word ass said, but are those places that should be advertising the movie at all? It's not, it's not a kid's movie. I, anyway. I really appreciate that they barely show the actual appearance of the aliens, so that would largely be a surprise. And they really don't show the extent of the subliminal messages. Basically, there's only one shot. You know, basically, the trailer shows a lot of the action. It does give away a few of the things that you really shouldn't know before watching the movie. Among other things, you see the homeless guy who became rich at the end of the movie very early on in the trailer, and just... Yeah, I think it shows a little too much, of, and and you see the the transport thing. I I don't think that was the yeah. So let's see. Yeah, so I rewatched Obscure's Lupa, a short look at They Live. I don't really. I don't have anything to say to it. I'm not like super upset that she didn't love the movie, although. If I had to take a guess, I would have guessed that she did. And I think she she does also basically say that, you know, there are a lot of things in the movie that that are things that she does love. But, yeah, you know, she's not... She doesn't just rant about how terrible it is. She, she gives some of the reasons she doesn't like it. And she says that she understands that other people like it, and that's fine, you know. I'm not sure I have anything to add to the Renegade Cut They Live video. Ah, there we go. They Live dash Renegade Cut is the title. I think he did a really great job. I had honestly forgotten some of the things that... I think I used to know all the things that he said about Reagan, but I had forgotten some of them. It really... the like. You know, before you dismiss this movie as just hysterics, if you actually know the stuff that Reagan... There's a lot of stuff in the movie that is... was actually done. You know, it's not, it, it's not just like one or two things that Carpenter didn't like about Reagan that he put in the movie. No, it, he built the movie entirely around... Right. 
See, I try to, I, I realize it doesn't always come across, but I try to read a bunch of stuff about these movies before I sit down and watch them, and as soon as, as possible after watching them, I sit down and record the video. I had forgotten that there was an abridged script for this movie, but I did put it in the file. I'm going to try not to, excuse me. I'm going to try to keep dead air to a minimum, but I'm just real quick going to read it. Right, it's by Alex W., one of my favorites of the authors. Let's see. Yeah, he makes fun of the, the title up here. Dang. And... Yeah, okay, this is pretty fun. A train pulls away to reveal Rowdy Roddy Piper and his enormous backpack that holds his backup, Rowdy Roddy Piper. And... He, okay, so the script says that since it's based on a short story, the, they didn't, yeah, he hopes he didn't have, they didn't have to pan out scenes too much, and the sunglasses are panning out of scenes. Eh, I don't know, I guess I can kind of see what he means. I just don't think it's. Yeah, I guess maybe it's, is that what bothers people? See, I love that. I love that it takes so long that we we see all these different ones. I mean, I guess yeah, I could see how you could trim it down, and for sure it is like the 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 let's see. I can I can see what they mean about padding. And They eat their f yeah. So this is where when Frank and Nada are in the the camp, they eat their food while complaining about their lives. Fun fact: also the tentative name for the sequel. They live in their lives. Yeah. There's I what was the thing? I let's see. I yeah I forgot to write it down, but I thought a funny sequel title. Let's see. Well, yeah, one thing I, th I thought it would be kind of funny if some someone watched They and then saw that there was a movie called They Live and thought, oh, it must, must be a sequel then. And let's see. And yeah, and, and they could like, yeah, they could make, they could make a sequel to this where the aliens have all been defeated, but... There's some kind of virus that brings them all back to life as zombies, and you, you see where this is going. This sequel would, of course, be called They Live Again. Or A New, maybe. Let's see. Yeah. Things are shit, man. We bailed out big businesses and they just made themselves richer and kept shitting on us. Oh man, I wonder if people in 2019 will have any way to relate to the problems of Yeah, and the yeah the script points out that Piper is maybe a little slow to realize that there's something with the church. Yeah, I can see what how it's it's padded. Yeah, no, I sorry, I see it now. 
I'm less bothered by padding when the padding has been done well. But it's true. Points of the parts of this movie, like minutes will pass without the plot or characters without the plot really developing and without yeah, sorry, without the plot or characters really developing. And that's yeah, that's why people that's why some people think it's slow. And I just I love those scenes still because they're never boring. I've seen movies that move a lot faster that are boring. And, you know, maybe they're not padded, but I lose interest watching them. So, yeah. Anyway, I, I see what they need now. Let's see. And yeah, and yeah, points out how long Piper spends just watching. Yeah, and points out the you know the the helicopter was silent to leave. Piper looked right at it. And how Piper only reacts once the yeah the cops start rounding up the resistance people. Let's see. And how they could really follow him through that window. Honestly, I remembered it as that he closes the window and we see the cop walk past, having not spotted it. So you know that's yeah that's my memory trying to make the scene make a little more sense than, yeah. Let's see. And... Yeah, and he puts on he puts on sunglasses and makes a yeah it, they make a a reference to the what is it CSI Miami I want to say with a yeah yeah he puts the sunglasses on and makes a a pun about a murder victim and goes yeah and then oh wrong box he puts on different sunglasses. Yeah, this is pretty fun. This isn't... They, they do a good job sometimes making jokes that really aren't criticisms. Uh, he Yeah, he puts the, the sunglasses on, the secret messages and everything. Right then, time to go make the prop department earn their fucking paycheck. That's a... Yeah, that's, that's funny. And clearly not a criticism. Let's see. Yeah, and yeah, he's looking at the different ads. That ad with the sexy babe in a bikini says marry and reproduce, which, yeah, sex sells. That's not a secret, really. And that closing sign says, says consume. Well, duh. Okay, so far this isn't exactly mind-blowing. More like mad is on Avenue 101 here. Yeah, and he points out why is the why is the alien wearing a wig? 
and you can project an illusion of a human face and head, but not hair. You may as well ask how I'm making full English words with my zero lips. Some aliens talking to their Dick Tracy two-way wrist radios. And let's see. <laughs> and the yeah, for those who don't know, the abridged script. I forget when they started, but after a while, they started just putting actual line over some of the over at least one line per script. You very frequently only a single line. And here it put the, I've come here to chew bubblegum and kick ass and I'm all about bubblegum. And instead of putting the prompt underneath it, it said, tell me you didn't need an actual line prompt for that one, right? Who goes to a fucking bank to chew bubblegum? Well, I came here to slice watermelon and push this on the lawn and I'm all out of watermelon, so there. Wow. And... Yeah, and they point out, you know, it's strange that the one hostage he chooses is hugely critical to the plot. Well, that's ridiculous. You're saying aliens are beaming some kind of signal into our brains to make us see and hear what they want. As the head of the local TV station and its giant signal beaming machines, I have to ask, how would they even do that? Rowdy falls a few stories down in a bloody heap, picks himself up, and shuffles off with only his theme music for solace. It says, the octaves tend to Rowdy's wounds and the minor thirds make hot soup. <laughs> Here's your week's pay. Good luck spending it. Yeah, and, and he rewrites the script to where it, he actually puts on the sunglasses, you know, put these on, please. Okay, that's like the simplest request possible. Even if you are a murdering psycho, it's probably safer to just humor you. Puts on sunglasses. What the? Yes, that's how it might have gone if John Carpenter hadn't decided instead to make one of the greatest scenes in the entire history of motion pictures. Now let's see how it actually played out. And let's see. Yeah, it goes over the fight. And yeah, Keith David says about putting on sunglasses, no way, man, two dudes hunting aliens in sunglasses, that's way too men in black. It doesn't even exist yet. I know, asshole, we can't steal their thunder before they even get a chance. Come on. Did you ever watch the sequels? We might be doing them a favor if we wipe out the entire franchise right here and now. Roddy and Keith continue to fight for a total of, let me just check the timer, holy shit, five whole minutes and 39 motherfucking seconds, which, god damn, I have a recipe for brown butter chicken that takes less than time than that. Anyway, at the end, Keith finally puts on sunglasses, Roddy keeps his intercontinental belt, and they sing, sign some autographs while well, the tag team title match gets ready. At the main desk, Keith gets in, checks in while Roddy keeps busy by being conspicuous as all fucking hell. But why should that matter? He's only wanted for mass murder and plaster all over every news report. However, they get through the room safely. Yeah, 
Yeah, and it goes over the... <laughs> Let's see. The various one-liners. Life's a bitch and she's back in heat. Uh, sure, whatever, let's go. Ain't low grand. Why the fuck would you even say that? Look, the bubblegum line was fun, but maybe you should quit while you're still mostly ahead. I ain't daddy's little boy anymore. Okay, please just stop. <laughs> There's a lot of resistance meeting tonight. Here's the address and the gun. The guys out front have strict instructions to only admit random assholes with sunglasses and a gun, so you'll be golden. That is a pretty good point. Like, there's no... They don't have to prove at all that they're not, like, hypothetically, you know... Then may, maybe he's, like, one of those... Uh, well, uh, what's it called? The... the Contacts. But how can he be sure that they're not humans working for the aliens? Let's see. Yeah, this is pretty funny. Check it out. We've upgraded to contact lenses. This will make life easier for the continuity people from here on out. Plus, the audience will see your eyes, which is nice. It is trickier to force people to try them on in an alleyway, but I reckon we're past that phase. And again, that's not that's not like a, a criticism of the movie. It's just a funny joke. <laughs> and points out about the climate change thing. And yeah, the fact that in real life they also have been getting away with that for a really long time. Welcome, Roddy and Keith. Can I interest you in Alien Watch? It's also got radio and teleportation abilities, plus solid steel, solid steel casing and timeless style. I got these wholesale. I can cut you a great deal. Yeah, hook us up. Oh, cool. They've got a pile of guns table. Don't mind if I do. Grab tons of guns. Just gonna make sure. Okay. It's the alien cops. They blow through the wall and start murdering all the La Resistance people, including Peter Jason, La Resistance guy, and Marius, and Garrosh, and Kyle, and Stan, and Poe Dameron, and Kwatu, Mike Donovan, and Ducroy, and Deja Vu. Um, let's see. And, yeah, it asks some questions, but, yeah. Look the, a look, the alien watch malfunctioned and immediately opened a portal on the street next to us. We can escape directly to, the air to their HQ. I wonder what happens if a watch breaks while swimming in the ocean. Would their HQ be immediately flooded? Or if you're a crowded subway, would random humans start dropping into... Yeah, it, let's see. Yeah, the, they sneak about and come across a big fancy banquet hall full of expensively dressed human collaborators who have sold out to the aliens. Ah, okay, this is the perfect place to abandon cover and just walk about unnoticed. Let's see. Just then, George Buckflower approaches them, but now all cleaned up and in a tuxedo. And if you watch this movie three times or so, back in the 80, 1980s without realizing this was the same character from the Shantytown, well, you're not alone. Let's see. 
come on, let me show you absolutely everything in this Alien HQ since there's no security protocols anywhere. And the, yeah, in his lines, he's constantly saying boys. And, excuse me. Aliens are indeed teleporting away from their Earth business. Sorry, teleporting away wearing their Earth business suits because despite their technological advances, they have not yet discovered the rule of dressing for your destination. Now, boys, let's parade into the signal generating room. This is the source of the alien concealing signal worldwide. That's right, boys. World fucking wide. Can I hand the ending to you on any more of a silver goblin platter? That's true. That's, uh, yeah. And, and then a guard goes, okay, I know we have this laissez-faire approach to guarding our most valuable assets, but maybe one it's time one of you showed a pass card or, like, anything. And, you know, Piper gets a, you know, here's our goddamn pass, you shoot the guard. At least now you're making some kind of effort. And let's see. And <laughs> and Meg confronts him with the gun on the rooftop. It's not too late. You can still sell out. Get your own tuxedo. As you've seen, we'll trust trust about anyone without with all our secrets. Ugh. Now drop the gun. Very well. I will drop my gun. Drops gun. But surprise, I have a second smaller gun. And let's see. The transmitter goes kablooey. There's schemes thwarted. The helicopter aliens decide to be good sports about the whole thing. Lol, no, they don't. They decide they shoot the fuck out of rock. Fuck. Lying in a pool of blood. Well, shit. Flips the bird, pins the bird. Bird taps out. Roddy dies. That's pretty funny. That's, and again, not not a criticism of the movie. I'm really glad that they don't try desperately to find criticisms, but instead make jokes that like, yeah, no way he just flips the door. No, no, he also pins it until it taps out. Um. Yeah, and the excuse me, the the alien and the woman there at the end, you know, the woman says, "Laugh it up, fuck nuts, but you assholes are done for now." And the other goes, "You sure? We still run everything, control the cops, have tons of drones, and of course our advanced tech. We can just switch to brutal, overt repression instead." Oh yeah, thanks a heap, Roddy. Okay, gonna go through the, copy it in the comments as well. Let's see. I don't know, maybe, maybe John Carpenter was kind of naive and thought that the ending, you know, that it wouldn't make sense for the ending to imply that we've won. I don't know, I guess I just don't, excuse me. Maybe that is what the ending actually conveys, and I just have trouble accepting that because it's so naive to me. It just there's no way. But yeah, you know the the I I can believe the idea that there would be an all-out war, 
and I do think that there is a even with all their advanced tech there's gonna be a lot of people that humans can take the, sorry a lot of aliens that the humans can take hostage right away you know not all of the aliens have guns they they may all have the wrist watches but you know the there would be some people who would realize what the wristwatches are about and use them against the other same as is done in the movie let's see In my version, Buck explains that the last 15 minutes is an obvious death dream after Riley got killed in, that, in the alley. How else to explain that dude randomly showing up in a tux with Wink Martindale's scalp on his head and full access to everything? Why nobody cared that they were totally armed walking into their Alien Traitor Award show. I like that. Alien Traitor Award show. That's, that's perfect. That's exactly what it is. Yeah. Let's see. That's right down the hall from where they do the news, which is also where Omega works, and where the only brainwash machine happens to be. Seriously, rewatch the end. Tell me how it's not a death dream. The real Rowdy was bleeding to death behind some trash cans while his brain was slowly shutting down. You know it's true. Let's see. And. Yeah, here's it. Yeah, Roddy begins to blast unarmed yuppie scum and any humans to try to stop him. I'm the good guy here, everyone. Remember that. I'm the good guy. Yeah. Let's see. Okay, I'm just briefly going to read it. This is kind of funny. We only make this look easy thanks to our extensive training at the Shadow of Bridges Fortified Enclave. The location of which is, of course, shrouded in secrecy and certainly is nowhere near Bracebridge, Ontario, Canada. So don't even bother looking there. Let's see. I'm sorry, this is funny. I have to read this out. Okay, so this is the the thing to yeah yeah for if you don't know now you'll know this was the two hundredth script by the author Alex W. So this is what someone posted. I think Craig. I think this is another one of the of the authors on the site. Hey Alex, do you like sentimental Robin Williams vehicles where he plays a creepy robot? Because you just had your bicentennial, man. That's that's funny. And And, yeah, guy yeah, says, love the cop giving up due to Piper going through a window, too. And... Hmm. I genuinely consider this to be the most underrated of the John Carpenter filmography. I also find it strange that it's not included in the Apocalypse trilogy of The Thing, Prince of Darkness, and The Mouth of Madness. The story ends with an apocalypse in the sense of the root word, apocalyptine, which means to uncover or to reveal. But then that is just me being an ar arbitrary groupings of movies. Okay. Let's see.
Okay, that was that. And final section. IMDb, Wikipedia, and critic sites. Excuse me. Okay, the tomato meter it has eighty six percent and a seventy nine percent audience score. Let's see, the average critic rating was seven point twenty three of ten, and of the the total count is 63 reviews and 54 of them are fresh and the average user rating was 3.87 and there's a total of 39,018 users excuse me and Carpenter eviscerates American consumerism and materialism, Reaganomics, as well as questions the vast class divide which exists in most American cities. Ultimately, the biggest take home from rewatching Ray Lynn in 2018 is how scarily relevant this 1988 effort still is to this day. A movie that used the horror genre to explore the nefarious nature of poverty, exploitation, consumer culture, and capitalism. Made during the Reagan era, Carpenter channels the conspiracy theories and social concerns of the day to imbue it with an aura of eerie truthfulness. Just gonna let's see. Campy satirical classic. There's lots of violence for the family. And And great cult flick. Man. Okay, so I'm skimming through the Rotten Tomatoes user reviews to see if I can find something. I read all these before watching the movie, but like I mentioned earlier, that my, some of them I read weeks ago. And... Almost all the way through. 
please remove this one. And okay, that brings us to Metacritic. First, the reviews by professional critics. The looniest movie of the season, also one of the most engaging. Okay. And user reviews from Metacritic. Man, I have a lot of notes still left. I'm going to have to skim a lot of this, or this video is going to get... I mean, it's already too long, but it's going to get... And... Yeah, some call out that they love the movie in part because of the fight scene. Okay, here we go. IMDB. So, yeah, the taglines. I have come here to chew bubblegum and kick ass, and I'm all out of bubblegum. Obey or else. An alien, sorry, alien aversion of the subliminal kind. Who are they, and what do they want? You see them on the street. Sorry. You see them on the street. You watch them on TV. You might even vote for once for... You think they're people just like you. You're wrong. You're dead wrong. Sorry. That started out as Amorpheus and ended up kind of Smith. But, yeah, I, th I think you can tell why I chose to do a Matrix voice for, for that one. Now, let's see. Yeah, so 20... Yeah, of the of the user ratings on IMDb. Let's see, twenty eight point four percent gave it seven, twenty five point five gave it eight, and the rest of them are not interesting. And okay, so trivia and. Roddy Piper, being a married man at the time of filming, refused to take his wedding band off. That's why in several scenes you can see a wedding ring on. I mean, that's legitimately sweet. That's like... Yeah, you know, what, what's that thing they say? Ladies, find you a man that has that kind of just... Yeah, I mean, a lot of people would understand, you know, it's it's a movie, it's not... You know, it's, it's not dating or something. It's not like he's going into a singles bar without a ring on or something. But, no, it's it's nice. And, let's see. Oh, sorry, right. The, the short story is called 8 o'clock in the morning, not 8 in the morning. But, yeah. Let's see. They lived, opened at the number one of the U.S. box office, and disappeared from theaters soon afterwards. Let's see. Now, John Connor wanted a truly rugged individual to play Nada, and he cast wrestler Roddy Piper in the role, lead role after seeing him in WrestleMania 3 from 87. Carmen remembered Keith David's performance in The Thing and wrote the role of Frank specifically for the actor. You can tell. It really, you know, again, I watched, the, I rewatched The Thing for the, I don't know, 20th time or something just yesterday. And it really, yeah, Keith David. I, 
in theory, there exists at least one movie that Keith David shouldn't appear in, even, even if only briefly. But only in theory. I absolutely love him. He's just, he's so good. Let's see. And John Carpenter, in addition to, you know, basing the movie on the, the original story, he also based it on an Eclipse Comics comic book adaptation of the story, which I would very much like to read. I did not, the, my library didn't have that one. Let's see. John Carpenter was impressed with Keith David's performance in The Thing and needed someone who wouldn't be a traditional sidekick but could hold his own. To this end, Carpenter wrote the role of Frank specifically for David. Yeah, it was George A. Romero that was being referred to in the, yeah. I'm sorry, that's that's kind of funny. I, And I mean, he's not, like, that's not John Carpenter saying, you know, oh, critics are like evil or something. He's just, he's having a little fun. Clearly, that's not supposed to be that, you know, the film critics rule the world or something. Yeah. The role of Nada was originally written for Kurt Russell. John Carpenter felt he should cast someone else after casting Russell in three of his films prior to this one. Escape from New York, The Thing, and Big Trouble in Little China. I think he would have been good, but I'm really glad. I'm, I'm sorry. I love Kurt Russell. I love him in The Thing. I love him in all three of those movies. I don't think he would have been quite as good as, as Piper. The only character given a first and last name is Holly Thompson. The aliens superficially resemble walking, rotting corpses. John Carver didn't want the aliens to look like the high-tech creatures of other science fiction films. He decided that since these beings were corrupting humanity, they, them excuse me, they themselves should resemble corruption of human beings. I think... Excuse me, I, I really like that. That's that's such a great, yeah. And it's it's really memorable. Like, think of how many high quote unquote high tech aliens you've seen in movies where it's like you know after a while they all blend together and it's like yeah whatever. This though, I'm not sure I know that many other movies that have this kind. Of, I, I guess Mars Attacks. You could you could draw a comparison between this and that, but other than that. I don't know that many aliens that look quite this, yeah. Let's see. Carpenter brought real homeless folks into the production for several scenes and smaller characters and gave them food as well as paychecks. I thought that was a really classy thing to do, says Piper. And Piper credits Carpenter and They Live, jump-starting the wrestler-turned-actor migration. I was the first wrestler ever in the history of wrestling to star in a major motion studio picture that became number one at the box office of the weekend, and that gave the itch to I don't know how many wrestlers. 
and not one of them to this day has put out a quality picture like this not one of them had has had a number one hit like this i mean certainly in you know the the movie the predator came sorry wait predator sorry it's just called predator the movie predator came out in 1987 so before this movie but Arnold Schwarzenegger was the star of that movie not a wrestler not the, sorry was there more than one wrestler cast in that movie I forget but the yeah the ain't got time to bleed guy was a wrestler but he was not the star of that movie Yeah, I'm sorry, this, I just gotta read this, this is not very related to, although it was in the MGP trivia for this movie, it's not re very related to this particular movie, but it's just really cool. After finishing the film, John Carpenter was going to direct an action horror film, Shadow Company, sometime around 1989, written by Shane Black and Fred Decker. The movie was to be produced by Walter Hill, who also co-wrote some of the script, with Kurt Russell in the main role. The script was about a group of U.S. Special Forces soldiers who died during the Vietnam War. Years later, after their bodies were brought back, the soldiers, who were members of an army project involving dark experiments, rise up from their graves, raid the armory from a nearby army base, and attack the town in which they were buried, killing everyone in it and wiping it off the ground during Christmas night. Due to some problems in pre-production, the movie was never made, although the original script has gained a cult following from fans of Carpenter, Black, and Decker. That sounds amazing. I really hope that does get made at some point. I guess, you know, what with the failure of The Predator, I guess there's... It might be a long time before Shane Black does, yeah, that, that's too bad. Let's see. The abandoned, overgrown locale where the homeless camp sits is still undeveloped. Now, I don't know how many, you know, some, some things... I wish they just put the year as of, you know, this and this year, it's still undeveloped. But, you know, yeah, it's very likely that it is, in fact, even if that was written some years ago, put into IMDb years ago. Anyway. Unsurprisingly, both men have a problem with authority. I have this adolescent hatred of authority, says Carpenter. I've never gotten over it since I was a kid. I could see that. I could see that in his movies. That Not, not only this one, but in general. Piper adds, ask me for my shirt off my back and I'll give it to you. Tell me, not a chance. Yes, yeah. After Nada kills several ghouls and exits into a side street, he comes face to face with human cop, who he disarms and tells to leave. The actual phrase he uses is, beat your feet. But according to Piper, the actor apparently misinterpreted on it on the first take and began running in place. God bless him, he says. His heart was into it big time. That's, that's adorable. That's... I can just I can just imagine it, and I really appreciate that Piper is like God, God bless him. That's it's, yeah. Uh, let's see. Piper is no fan of his performance during the scenes where Nada and Frank talk post-fight in the motel room. Carpenter tells him he was proud of him. Let's see, we were proud of him though for opening up and delivering an authentic, real performance. Piper wishes he had pushed himself harder, but Carpenter tells him that he still watches his old films 
thinking he could have done this or that better. And yeah, I I I think that's like I th I think if you're if you're I think it's extremely common for artists to look back and be like, "That should have done that better." And I'm, I'm, it's really nice to read that. You know, I, I'm, I take it this was from like a commentary track or something that the two of them did, and I haven't heard that commentary track, but it's nice to read that John Carpenter is so nice and reassuring to him. I have to say, I absolutely love the commentary track for the thing and. If that's the level of camaraderie and just passion on display for all of John Carpenter's commentary tracks, I have got to get more of the movies on DVD because I just love, you know, that commentary track and the one for Aliens where, like, Michael Bean and Bill Paxton, R.I.P., you know, various get together and talk and like it's 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 just it's great to hear how how much they like being together and you know talking and joking. Let's see. On the commentary, Carpenter pointed out that Piper has made more movies than he has. I've only made twenty, says the director. Yeah, but you made twenty good ones, replies Piper. Just so nice just yeah let's see and let's see yeah you probably already know there's you know there's a south park episode i'm not gonna read out the title of the episode but you can find it where the yeah where where the fight in in this is redone in, in South Park. Let's see. Uh, I gotta... Yeah, I'm gonna continue to skim. This is very... There's way too much. Piper regretted his performance in the final scene, flipping the bird to the bad guys, and thinks it should have been straight and strong instead of weak and slightly bent. I feel like there's a good case to be made for both. I think it works really well in the film that it is this, you know, weak and slightly bent. Like, literally, he's... It is his last breath. He is... He's, he is dying. He is full on. He is unable. He's he's almost unable to move at all. And that's what he chooses to do. You know, with what little he has left of movement. I, I feel like it would have been a little too... Don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm a big fan of, of the visual. But I, I think it's... I, I, I think it was the right way to go. And let's see. Okay, yeah, so here's a list of people who are considered to play Nada. Alec Baldwin, Michael Bean, Brian Boss, Bridget Fraser, Bruce Campbell, Tom Cruise, Harrison Ford, Mel Gibson, John Lee Jones, Michael Keaton, Digital Lambert, Stephen Lang, Dolph Lundgren, Michael Madsen, Bill Paxton, Ron Bowman, Ron Schwarzenegger, Sylvester Stallone, Patrick Swayze, Jean-Claude Van Damme, and Bruce Willis. I don't think any of them could have could have done as good of a job, but I definitely do think some. Let's see. I mean, Michael Bean. I want him to be in every movie made. So, let's see. 
I think it would have been fun to see Jeff Bridges in in the yeah I can I can kind of see yeah Bruce Campbell obviously would also have been let's see Tom Cruise could definitely have been interesting yeah Harrison Ford I could see that Mel Gibson Tom Lee Jones sure Michael Keaton I think someone like let's see, I mean yeah all of them would have been pretty good picks. I I could have definitely have seen someone like Jean-Claude Van Damme in yeah. You know, if if you don't if you haven't seen him do a good job acting, watch the movie, let's see. It has several titles. Lionheart, A Wall, Absent Without Leave, Wrong Bet. That movie he does do really good acting in and that was from around this same time. Actually, it might have been the same year, I forget. Often cited by British author David Ick, is that how you know? As John Carpenter's best film. I think a strong argument could be made, yeah. It definitely is a very it's it's one of the best. Piper points out about the shot of his character John Mata walking by himself. Lonely guy, always walking by himself, which is pretty much the character and pretty much the truth, he says. Kind of a little bit of an introvert. The film was released in Europe as Invasion Los Angeles. Does that mean that Battle Los Angeles is a sequel in name only And John Carpenter has a uh, cameo, as he has in others, and yeah, it's it's audio like in at least some of the other. It actually, comes so yeah, certainly in Halloween, he also has an audio uh, cameo, and he's the one. He's the voice who says "sleep." Right, and that brings us to The Goofs. There's only 20. I would have expected way more for, you know, it's not, anyway, but no, there's no, there's no one that I'm going to read out. Okay, so the, yeah, there are 42 quotes. I might read some of them. I've walked a white line my entire life and not thought about to screw that up. White line's in the middle of the road. It's the worst place to drive. They are dismantling the sleeping middle class. More and more people are becoming poor. We are their cattle. We are being bred for slavery. I like the line, they close one more factory, we should take a sledgehammer to one of their fancy fucking foreign cars. Mama don't like tattletales. You dirty motherfucker. Outside the limit of our sight, feeding off us perched on top of us from birth to death are our owners our owners they have us they control us they are our masters wake up they are all about you 
all around you. Where'd you get those sunglasses? From the Tooth Fairy. The poor and the underclass are growing. Racial, racial justice and human rights are non-existent. They have created a repressive society and we are their unwitting accomplices. The world needs a wake-up call, General. We're going to phone it in. Now look, uh, things turned out a little sour for me today. You're not the only one. Yeah, well, I'm sorry, but I needed you to get away. No, you have two guns. You're not sorry. You're in charge. We could be pets. We could be food. But all we really are is livestock. You're fighting the forces of evil that none of us can see without sunglasses. I really love how she just complete like, and and that's also that's John Carpenter himself saying, "Yeah, I know how stupid it sounds." Okay, and there's. They live connections, I don't think. Yeah, I'm just gonna quickly get past this. And yeah, a lot of references where the bubblegum line is quoted. Okay, and soundtrack. The Siege of Justiceville. All out of bubblegum. These are some really great titles for songs. Okay, and... And frequently asked questions. There's not really any. I have to say, this is. I've seen a lot of. I've seen a lot of facts for for movies where it has the question, "What is its original title about?" This is one of the most unique ones. Because the what it usually is is a overall like plot synopsis and and such. Or wait, or am I thinking of the ones that have how does the movie end? anyway? I'm just I'm just briefly gonna read a lot of some of it. One day an ordinary type fellow discovers quite by accident question mark in parentheses I I mean, did someone write that and then somebody else was like, I mean, I don't know that I would say it's by accident, or did the, I don't know, anyway, that the Earth is in the process of being taken over by otherworldly beings that you cannot see without the special help of specially constructed everyday items. 
No one believes him until they can see it from themselves, and the movie takes off on that theme. The story itself is fascinating, and John Connor delivers it well. What will they do? What can they do? How? The movie reveals by watching. Get to it. I I like that a lot. I think that should be in every fact, but it's I haven't seen it in, in many other... Yeah. And that brings us to, finally, the Wikipedia entry and how it's... There's 32 pages of just of them. Out of 140... Oh, wait, no, sorry. Then there's IMDb reviews, of course. Yeah, we're going to see how much... Yes. I've been recording for a long time now. I might stop without... Yeah. Anyway. So... Skimming through to see if there's any that I want to read. <laughs> George Buck Flower is listed as drifter slash collaborator. And let's see. Yeah, here we go. A proposed remake in fall of twenty ten. There was development on a remake of John Carpenter's 1988 film, They Live. Within the producer role in 2011, Matt Reeves signed on to direct and write the screenplay. That could have been very interesting. I, uh, let me think. Matt Reeves, he directed Cloverfield, I think? And or The Cabin in the Woods? I, f I forget. And he's doing Batman right now. But yeah, since then there have been no new developments. No, 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 since the movie is in development hell. I, I could definitely see a remake working since it's very relevant. Okay. Yeah, the... Let's see, that brings us to the IMDb reviews. So... I am just gonna see if I can find something that I especially want to. Sometimes the movie has an un unintentional comic air to it. There are several, let's say, it's very underrated. You know, when the when the movie critics turn out to be aliens, you know, they actually, you know, the thing being said there, the, the, or one of them says, you know, John Carpenter needs to show more restraint when it comes to violence. Really, in this movie, he, I mean, compared to something like The Thing, which again, I, I The Thing is probably my favorite of his movies, but then there's also Halloween. I, th I can't. I cannot choose which of those I love the most. It depends. But like, both of them do exactly what they mean to do so incredibly well. But anyway, back to this movie. Compared to The Thing, this movie is very... Uh, what was the word? Restrained in, in violence. So, yeah. I think that is, that's, that's all the notes that I had. Oh, hold on. Did I get all of the, I, yeah, let me, let me briefly check. Let's see. Nope, never mind. 
yeah, so I think it would be great if they made another one. And I mean, would it matter a lot if it comes out like super soon or like after Trump is out of office? I mean, I'm not sure that Trump and They Live is especially like, it's more the, you know, my, I mean, Trump, it, it, I heard a commentator say it used to be subtext and with Trump it's just text. Trump says out loud what the other Republican, excuse me, politicians hint at. And so it, it wouldn't really be necessary for it to be, yeah. I, I think it's it would be well worth making, and it is also, I, you know, today watching the, the movie, there are some aspects that are a little uncomfortable, and it's because, I already mentioned the, the thing that, that Piper goes around shooting all these people in public, like, you know, he doesn't gain anything from going into the bank and shooting people. And I, you know, like I said, he didn't, he didn't mean to go into the bank. He was just hiding from the cops. But he doesn't have to start shooting them. The, to be fair, one of them does, does shoot at him, and then he shoots that one. But the other ones he shoots, I guess the idea is supposed to be he's shooting them before they have a chance to shoot at him. But... No, I, I, it's, it's, I'm not saying, when it was made, they, they did feel like this was okay, because there was an extreme anxiety. I, uh, I'm never gonna, I'm not gonna pretend that I'll ever completely understand. I can empathize with, but it's impossible to understand how tense the situation was during the Cold War if you didn't live through it at all. And I didn't, so I was I was very very little when it ended. But the the no, it it really is a it you know I I understand why they did it at the time, but it is something that hasn't aged well, you know. And I think the yeah I I could see. There, there are definitely things they could do with a remake or spiritual successor or something. So, yeah. But that is all I had to say about that. So, I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoyed watching and recording. And I'll catch you next time.